So uh, I just want to start with welcoming everyone to our California Water Symposium. Uh, it's going to be a very uh, to the point afternoon, not a lot of chit chat, but just a lot of uh, information that's going to be shared with all of you uh, from uh, Patrick Pergans, who's been a 40 year plus uh, forensic researcher and solutionary here in California. We also have Dan Bacher, who is probably one of the most knowledgeable people on the status of fish uh, in California as it relates to water. Uh, we also have Bob Saunders from Sacramento River Watershed Project, who is an activist here in Sacramento and wears many hats. Uh, and we also have uh, Harry uh, Eldridge, who will be here talking a little bit about environmental toxins too. So uh, it doesn't sound sexy when you hear it, but believe me, the information that's going to be shared, the value of this video, and uh, the booklets of information that we're going to be able to send out after this event uh, will be of great use to all of you. So um, the book, before we start, you can see, is based on the work of Patrick Porgans. Uh, it's called, uh, his book is Truth Decoded. You can actually get that online through Amazon. But this is a whole booklet that basically outlines very clearly all of the information, the statistics, the maps, the graphs about exactly what's going on. I think uh, uh, this is really um, 40 years of Patrick's work distilled down to make it uh, easily assimilable and understandable so that as you go out and talk to people and we hopefully continue to build some synergy around uh, water advocacy and activism here in California, this will actually give you the tools that you need uh, and all the research, the forensics from uh, the state's accounting um, and where the money is going to the people who are uh, contributing to this uh, horrific issue here in the state. So um, I wanna just to welcome all of you. Thank you for joining here on the Zoom call today. Really briefly, I'm Michael DiMartino. Um, Bob Saunders and I, uh, for years, have been working on something what we call the uh, Sacramento River Watershed Project. It's just another umbrella uh, organization that's trying to do good. Unfortunately, as many of you know, there's also a lot of organizations and nonprofits that uh, have very high paid executives and boards that are, are really great at, you know, maybe doing things and shuffling papers, but yet, you know, decades have gone by and the problems uh, haven't been resolved. And actually they've gotten worse around water quality, uh, fish populations, et cetera. So, um, you know, Bob and I are just uh, supporters of a great cause as many people that are doing incredible work. I know Dan Bacher's here. Uh, he's been working with the uh, Winnemum Wintu for years in relationship to the Salmon Run. And uh, of course, we're in um, ancestral uh, Miwok land. I'm in Nevada City, uh, the territories of the Nisinan and the Maidu. So, you know, even though we're here, there's many people that have been stewarding and caretaking uh, water in California for uh, thousands of years before uh, the arrival of uh, colonial Europeans. And uh, it's pretty sad to see over the last 200 years of how we've really uh, had a, a horrific impact on uh, the Sacramento River watershed. Uh, we're gonna be talking a little bit today too um, about uh, the mega droughts, the mega uh, fires, the mega floods, uh, which have all been talked about for years by Patrick Porgans, but now in the media and people are now becoming aware uh, of what's happening. Uh, when you tell people California flooding, you usually get a chuckle, uh, but we're gonna share a little bit of the science of what's happening now in real time. I'm gonna show a few short videos about the snowpack melt in the Lake Tahoe area uh, in Yosemite, which has just been evacuated right now. Uh, what's been happening in Mon uh, Monterey uh, County with the Pajaro River. Uh, Patrick raised the red flag about Oroville Dam spillway years ago and all of these things that are happening. And we're gonna talk a little bit about the horrific idea of the sites reservoir. So we're gonna cover a lot of ground in a very short time. Again, if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we will definitely uh, get to them. So uh, at the end, we are gonna offer also California Water Reality, What Can You Do? This is a living document that we'll be elaborating on as time goes by, but it's gonna talk about, you know, okay, you have this information now, what can you do? Uh, primarily, we're gonna be talking again today about the water privatization and mismanagement, but we're also gonna be talking and elaborating more of what's happening, uh, again, with uh, environmental toxins, what's happening with the fish population, et cetera. 
Um, I'm gonna streamline this part because I know Dan Bacher, who uh, is a journalist, not only for Fish Snipper Magazine, but writes for many magazines and actually assisted us uh, along with Bob Saunders and Crest in getting the press release out for today. Um, but uh, I know he has an engagement later today too. So we're gonna kind of compress and then start to stretch out and have more interactivity. So uh, please, as best as possible, just uh, follow along. And again, thank you so much for uh, taking this time uh, to join the broadcast of this water uh, webinar today. So again, the issues we'll be talking about today are privatization, mismanagement, environmental toxins, and, and things related to also infrastructure and energy. Yeah, Dan's gonna talk first, I, I got that, thank you. Uh, we've also ta talked a little bit about cycles of nature and human impact with the mega drought, mega fire, mega flood, mega erosion. And my personal uh, passion of something that um, as a permaculture designer that I'm gonna talk about a little bit later is the environmental toxins that are absolutely um, destroying the state, destroying the watershed, uh, contaminating soil, and really have um, horrific effects on Californians. And those will include everything from household toxins that we all probably use, uh, forever chemicals that are now part of California's uh, fire management and fire retardant program. These chemicals do not go away. Um, also uh, industrial agriculture. Um, one of the things I found out with doing the Soul of the Delta film, which some of these people were involved in, where we were talking about the Delta Tunnel, we got a lot of support from the community there. But what we found out is that a lot of the people doing agriculture in the Delta uh, got afraid about the reality that even though they're against the proposed Delta Tunnel, the fact that the majority of them, like 99% of them are not organic and are continuing to contaminate the watershed, which goes into the San Francisco Bay, which goes into the Pacific. Again, watersheds are connected. This is not just a California problem. This is really a much bigger problem. Uh, I'm gonna talk briefly about the mining legacy. I'm gonna talk about what's happening with fr fracking, livestock runoff, factories, industry, and of course, uh, microplastics. Um, also what's happening right now with uh, herbicides and pesticides, uh, what's happened, which, you know, I live in Nevada County. They're trying to reopen the Idaho, Maryland mine and pump millions of gallons of water a day into Wolf Creek, which will go down eventually into the Yuba, which eventually will find its way into the Sacramento River. So the, you know, opening of that mine and, and, and draining those uh, old mines is gonna be horrific uh, effect uh, to a lot of people, not to mention the mercury and the arsenic. Um, also, Nevada Irrigation District uh, sprays uh, herbicides and algicides several times a year in the water district, over 450 miles of waterways, which again, flow downhill and get into all of our water and our watershed and our groundwater. And uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the weather, weather um, modification of the geoengineering that's happening. I know that you know people can say that's a conspiracy concept, but I, I have been in communication with Dane Wigginton, who is very knowledgeable. Uh, you can go to his website, Geoengineering Watch, about the acidification of soil and the water and the huge uh, die-offs of forests, which are, you know, we need forests to help clean the water in the watershed. And right now, there's, there's uh, almost, uh, well, there's over a half million people in California that are suffering from extreme lack of clean water due to just agriculture alone. So I'll get back to that. And with that, I want to bring in Dan Bacher. Uh, and again, Dan's gonna speak specifically on his area of expertise. Um, I found out recently that I guess commercial fishing uh, has been, that's it, it's, it's, it's done with. All fishing and sports fishing in California is, is done. And a big part of that is because of what's, what's happening. So I wanna invite Dan Bacher uh, to come up and share a little bit, if you could, Dan. Yep, come on up now. And uh, Dan's going to share a little bit with you. Uh, and, um, you know, it, it's just a shame uh, in my work uh, with the uh, Water Palooza event and the Sacramento River Watershed Project. Of course, fish are not only part of a sport and livelihood here in Californians, but also a, a main source of sustenance for a lot of the indigenous tribes uh, and people here. So, beyond recreation, they have a very practical and functional purpose. So with that, I'm going to introduce uh, Mr. Dan Bacher. Thank you very much. Stand, go back a few feet. Perfect. Yeah, if you stand there and talk, and I'll do the slides when you're ready, Dan. Okay, the salmon season 
all the way from Cape Falcon in Oregon to the Mexican border or California. So essentially the vast majority of Oregon waters and all California waters will are closed to commercial salmon fishing this year. Um, there's some coho fishing, limited coho fishing uh, in Oregon and that coho salmon fishing is banned in California. It's been banned for years because of the low numbers. Um, the uh, the uh, closure that I'm talking about was implemented on April 7th by the Pacific Fishery Management Council, which is a, um, is a uh, body of the, of the federal government. And in, on May 17th, the California Fish and Game Commission will follow the federal regulations with adopting the state regulations for the rivers. That's the Sacramento, um, uh, McCallamy, Feather River, and American Rivers. Those are the four rivers in the Central Valley that have been open in recent years. And there will also be closures on the Klamath and the Trinity Rivers. Um, this will affect tens of thousands, if not more, up and of uh, businesses and people up and down the California and the, the uh, Oregon coast um, on the Klamath River in particular, it will impact four tribes, the Yurok, the Karuk, the Hoopa Valley and the Quartz Valley Reservation. And um, they ha ha will not, have a commercial season on the Yurok Reservation and it will be very limited subsistence fishing. But those, the, the specifics of that haven't been developed yet. Um, I'm waiting for a call from one of the tribal biologists to, to uh, give me the latest on that. Okay, so why? Why is these rivers closed? Why is this happen? You know, this didn't happen in a vacuum and it has, at least the Sacramento closure, complete closure has happened before. Um, that happened that the ocean closed and the rivers closed to recreational fishing and, and, um, back in 2008, 2009, and it only opened um, partially in 2010. And then it wasn't until 2011 that there was a complete opening of the season on the coast. Um, so, um, the, the estimates of the fish, um, are, are real low. And these are, this is what it was. The, the, um, federal scientists, they estimate there was only 169, 800 Sacramento Fall River Chinook in the ocean. Um, uh, last year, they estimated that there would have been um, 19,694 fall run Chinook that would actually come up the river to spawn, but only 61,995 showed up. So it was a big collapse in the river, in the Sacramento River system last year. And, and, um, Right now, and it does, the these estimates that they make are really, really, uh, really off base. You, you know the data that they have, so uh, is not accurate as many um, numbers crunchers among the fishing community and on the Pacific Fishery Management Council have concluded. Um, but so so the there was uh, they there was an overestimate of the fish. And so they, at least the commercial fishermen went over the harvest, but they were, they were under the guidance. They were told that there was this many fish. So, and people were complaining about it for years about that the data was completely flawed. Okay, that's the first thing, the problem. The second thing is, and Patrick will talk to you about this in depth, is water. Okay, 
during, you, you know, the state and the federal governments that completely mismanaged the water. Um, they didn't allow enough water for the fish to spawn uh, successfully. And um, this is, this is a, the, the fall run Chinook is supposed to be the relatively healthy fishery. And it's gotten so bad that one of the fishing guides, Bob Spar, has petitioned the, the state of California and he plans to fit, uh, petition this federal government for endangered species, fish, um, endangered species listing of the fall run Chinook salmon of the Sacramento River. And uh, the uh, Klamath forecast was down real low too. They estimated there's only 103, 800 fish on the entire ocean. Um, well, I mean, uh, called Klamath River fish. So this has uh, been the lowest since 1997. Um, the lowest forecast ever of Sacramento River salmon was 122,000 back in 2009, whereas the lowest Klamath forecast ever was 54,200 in 2017. Okay, what will this mean to people? Okay, here, this will mean economic. Um, distress. It's and, and in, as in the last time this happened, it's going to mean um, divorces, suicides, um, people having all sorts of mental health problems because they're going to be deprived of an income. They're going to have to look for other sources of income. And this was all avoidable if the state and federal governments had obeyed the laws, obeyed the, 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 the Clean Water Act, obeyed the Endangered Species Act, both the state and the federal acts, and, and, and provided the cold water that was needed for, for salmon. The, the, uh, the state says, oh, it's the drought. No, no. Okay, the drought was a factor. The fact that the fish are feeding on, on different species than they used to the salmon are concentrating on, on anchovies, which is a big problem with the warming of the waters off the coast. But the main problem is the complete and total mismanagement of the water during a drought, Amen. not releasing enough fish and too much water being exported to corporate agribusiness, to the big ag oligarchs of the San Joaquin Valley like Stewart and Linda Resnick and the Westlands Water District. And those are the people, particularly the Resnicks, that contribute to the governor. And this is why these policies continue. Do you want to push back just a little bit, Dan? Okay. I also, when you're ready, I can put up some of the images of the articles and stuff I got up behind you. Thank you. Okay. So this will have a huge impact upon the coast. I mean, it's Okay, you know, most of what's been written on is the ocean, okay? And that's gonna be huge, but it's gonna impact all sorts of communities in the Sacramento Valley. It's gonna impact bait shops, it's gonna impact um, fishing guides that have been, you know, have gone to other states. The number of people that I used to fish with, they've moved to other states, Oregon, Washington, or Nevada. And to fish like Pyramid Lake and other other bodies of water that are better managed, and um, with this this um, with this major collapse of fish of the Sacramento River salmon, there's also been a big a big decrease and collapse of the endangered spe species of the spring run Chinook and the winter run Chinook. Let's look at the spring run Chinook. That used to be the most abundant fishery, the most abundant salmon run in the entire Sacramento Valley, okay? And, the, and now it's just a remnant you have. And in 2021, you had, there was a, a, a epic, record spring run on Butte Creek, um, the, the state and federal authorities keep talking about, we need wild fish. Well, they got wild fish and they came back and spawned. Yet PG&E 
wouldn't release the water, the cold water it was necessary to keep them alive. So um, the exact figure that they counted was 907, 173 out of 21,850 adult Chinook perished before spawning. So a great opportunity to restore the fishery was lost. And these are wild native fish. Um, and only 850 of them survived to spawn. Last year, there was a lot smaller run, but, and there was better spawning success. Um, that's because it was a smaller run and there was, there was cooler water that came at the right times. Um, now we, and, and uh, we go to the winter run Chinook, which I spent many hours with my former boss, Hal Bonslet, who was, who was the publisher of the Fish Nipper, in meetings and writing articles about the, um, getting endangered spat, uh, status on both, under both the state and the Federal Endangered Species Act. Well, after, after uh, 30 years, <laughs> We still, um, you know, have major problems. The vast majority of the winter run Chinook that spawned, um, they, they didn't survive. Only 2.6% of them survived in 19 uh, or in 2021. And in, in uh, last year, only, 5,561 adults returned to spawn. So um, this, you got to look at this. Okay, even after Shasta Dam was built in 1969, though, can anybody guess what the run of the winter run Chinook was? Just guess a number, how many fish showed up? Two million. Oh no, nothing like that. 117,000. That contrasts with 5,000 now. And this is after we spent, you know, um, decades supposedly um, enforcing the Endangered Species Act. So when it comes to enforcement, the Endangered Species Act is not being enforced well by the state and federal governments. Now we, we move on to Delta smelt. Because um, they're a, a species that's an indicated species, they show the health of the entire Bay Delta ecosystem. They're only found in the Delta. They're the only um, um, place where you find Delta smell. And for the last six years, I've been documenting every year, zero Delta smell have been found in the fall midwater trial surveys. Okay, there have been a few Delta smell found in other surveys, but this is the baseline that started in 67. This fish was, in 1967, this is just when this pump started operating, was the most abundant fish in the entire estuary. They were ubiquitous. Everywhere you'd see schools of Delta smelt and, and jumping. And guess how many, they don't, they're not there anymore. And they've started a captive breeding program. They keep them in an aquarium. And, you know, they have a captive breeding program in Byron, California, the um, federal government overseas. But, you know, the, and they've been reintroducing them, but the problem is there isn't good survival. Why? Because those, those uh, fish, um, th they're, they're being reintroduced to a habitat that is no longer suitable for them. So that, uh, so we got the Delta smelt, we got the spring run Chinook, we got, the winter run Chinook, all on the verge of extinction. And now we got the, um, what, is, what is called the driver of West Coast fisheries. The, because it, I mean, two states and uh, depend on the Sacramento River for salmon because the salmon moved north, the Sacramento River salmon moved north. So they, they're a big chunk of, of, the or of what the Oregon commercial fleet would catch. So this is the situation we have. And just, I'd like to end saying, what are the three main causes of uh, the collapse of all these fish that were once so abundant? Well, first of all, water. water. Second, water. 
And third, water. Okay, there's all sorts of other factors. Pollution's important. Um, thiamine deficiency among the fit that the, the, the salmon get from, from eating, um, have, having a more restricted diet and not feeding upon ocean krill, shrimp. You know, that's a factor. Um, the, you know. Um, Real quick, I'm sorry. Can everyone please quiet their microphones? We're hearing some background noise. We're gonna have questions in just a minute for Dan before Patrick comes up, but please, if you quiet your microphone because some people might be seeing other people's images as their main screen. Thank you, go, go ahead, Dan. Okay, so, so um, it, you know, these other factors are important. Um, municipal pollution um, from, from cities. Yeah, that all has an impact. Predators. But the, the main cause of the collapse, as, as Frank Fisher, uh, um, who was a maverick fishery biologist that told the truth, and he's the one that basically exposed what he called the black hole in the de of death in the Delta back in 1992. And he went around and talked to groups up. And he was, he was on a mission to tell people why the winter winter needed to be um, declared uh, um, an endangered species. And he, he, he drew an X, an X up on a, a chalkboard at a meeting I went to. And he says, this is the X. Um, he says, you have increasing exports and then an exact line down, he says, increasing exports, uh, decreasing numbers of salmon. He says, that's the black hole of death, that they enter in the, in the delta and they die because they get sucked up into reverse flows caused by delta pumping. So um, again, the main cause of the decline of all these fish is terrible state and federal government management and the bad management of the reservoirs and the continually pumping like this year, both the state and the federal water projects are gonna get 100% of, of their allocation. They've been complaining for years and they're getting it all this year. So um, if there are any questions. All right. Yeah, I, this is Bob, I have a question for you. You mentioned about the devastation to um, a, a lot of tribal people and what's gonna happen economically and they have to go, go get other kind of jobs, but of course, it's also going to affect their traditions and, yeah. um, and also their a main food source for them. Right. How, how do you feel that the loss of the salmon fishery and other fisheries um, will affect the ecological balance of nature? Um, it, oh, it'll have a, um, a, t a terrible impact, but, it, but it, you know, economically and on, on the balance because the whole ecosystem um, it depends on the salmon because the salmon go up into what used to be rivers that went all the way up into the mountains and the high up in the San Joaquin and in California they go higher than anywhere else up to 5,500 feet and and to spawn particularly the spring run and they, they spawn, spawn way up in the mountains in the cold waters and spring water where they you know and they go every year and those, those uh, fish used to die. When they die, their carcasses would be stay in the river and keep the food chain going because all sorts of insects and other fish. Um, I mean, like for instance, in Alaska, they have a, a, um, a dead salmon fly, you know, that imitates a dead salmon because the, the, the trout and the steelhead, they feed on the meat of the dead salmon at times. And it's all, it's, it, it, it's recirculated into the nutrients of the soil and the trees and the entire ecosystem. And so it's gonna have a devastating impact, the fact that there's less salmon coming back to these rivers. Um, and the, uh, the fishing game, unfortunately, kills all the salmon and then it, get, it, it sends them to a, uh, a, uh, a, a, a processor that takes the salmon uh, and trucks and they truck them out of state. So, and then they give uh, a certain amount to, to uh, tribes, to uh, Native Americans, but I mean, most of it, they're killed and instead they should be putting those dead salmon 
after their spawn back in the river because that enhances the whole ecosystem. That is like the fertilization of the river. Okay, um, any other questions? Thank you. Yeah, how big is a delta smelt? About four or five inches? Um, no, a lot smaller. Okay. A delta smelt, about two to three inches. Okay. It's two to three inches long. And, and it's, um, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it, it wasn't, um, I know some species used to use it as a food source, but it was, it was, it was very small. So it wasn't like, like um, when people think of smelt, they think of the, the like the surf smelt um, and other types of smelt, jack smelt, and they get a lot bigger. Like a jack smelt gets like this bigger, and they're a member of the a, a, a member of the uh, smelt family, but they're a really small one. Would delta smelt generally live for two or three months or longer? No, they li they live um, longer, but but they're um, they uh, you know they're 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 the reason why it's so important to keep them alive is because they demonstrate how healthy the entire ecosystem is. If they're, they're the first to go. And then there's other indicators. Striped bass, which is an introduced species, are also a, a strong indicator because they're an estuary fish. They move in and out of the estuary. They go out in the ocean, they go to the bay, they go to the river, but they depend heavily on the delta. Um, for their runs, and they're, they're another indicator. But the delta lives in the delta smelt, the difference between it and the, uh, the salmon, the striped bass, and other species, it lives entirely in the delta all its life. And it goes into brackish water, but it doesn't go into salt water like striped bass, salmon, and other fish do. Any other questions? I'm gonna ask you one from here. Someone, okay. someone on the chat had a question. And uh, thank you for chiming and, in. And could I say, just wanted to add, it. I mean, this is all. Um, so, so, so here's a question. Okay. Uh, someone on the Zoom, and this is something I know Bob and I were talking a lot about. Has anyone tested for glyphosate contamination in the waters of the Sacramento River Delta, which are over a thousand miles of water? I'm sorry, I don't know that. I, 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 I want, you know, possibly. Uh, well, well, fair enough, and we can get we can get to that now yes. a little bit later in the. Uh, yeah, but one All right, everyone has everyone. Can you please uh, mute for now? I can hear a lot of chatter in the background. It's a little distracting for everybody. Another question was, um, um, a mass remineralization program of riparian corridors that feed the delta could be one way to restore nutrient levels, soil remineralization and broad spectrum. And that comes from uh, Andrew Mount, who's actually on the call. So have you heard anything about- No, uh, I mean, that sounds like there's a whole bunch of strategies that we need to take. You know, like um, that sounds like a good thing along with putting salmon back um, after their spawn back in the river, the hatcheries, that, that would help, help the ecosystem a lot. Right, okay, just two things that I really wanted to emphasize. There, there is some positive news. Um, uh, we, on the Klamath, there, the, uh, the, in spite of all the bad stuff that's been going on for years regarding water and, and uh, agri or the, the agricultural interests up there getting water lots of times, uh, prioritized over the tribes and other users, it seems like, um, you know, there's going to be a giant epic project to remove the dams. And this is being done by the tribes, fishermen, environmentalists, and the state and federal governments. Um, so this is, a, this is a move in the positive direction because the, and it's taken a lot of work you know, I started work, working on it back in uh, 2002 when, when the big fish kill happened. And the tribes have been done direct action protests and, and done all sorts of major work to make this possible. And the rivers where they have been restored, like the Elwha River, have seen an enormous increase in salmon spawn what they, once they get back into the headwaters. Um, the other thing is that the Winnemem Wintu tribe 
um, in collaboration with the state and federal governments are reintroducing in an experimental program, Winter Run Chinook, which will eventually come from the original Winter Run Chinook that are now um, thriving in Rakaira and other rivers in New Zealand um, back into the McLeod River. But um, so there are some positive things in spite of the really negative water policies that have driven. The levee was uh, breached. Flooding. Wasn't there something too about the cannibal salmon they introduced or some sort of GMO salmon that was uh, decimating anything like other species? Do you know anything about no, that? No, I haven't heard anything about that. Um, there, okay. th that's been, you know, G as far as I know, GMO salmon aren't in, in, in California. There, there's, uh, there's been a big fight up in the Northwest and also in the Northeast. Because, and and other other countries where where uh, salmon have been introduced. I have but, a question for Dan. <coughs> yes, Patrick Morgan. So, what was the last count on the troll that the dolphins snuffed? How many did we have? I don't know millions that were there once. Zero. <coughs> Zero. This was, as far as I can see, the the six year in a row. That there was no delta smell, and up to that point, they've been getting lower and lower and lower, and then finally, to just you know, you know one environmental um, activist joked that there's more, and this was like eight years ago, that there's more delta smith delta uh, water uh, lawyers um, litigating over delta water on both sides than there are delta smell left, and it's it's it's. It's a it's a it's a tragedy, and they could bring them back if they restored the habitat and the maybe, water. Maybe, water. Dan, maybe what we need to do is to uh, to increase the amount of uh, um, of all the things you're saying about replenishing uh, the salmon industry and having less loss of Yeah. Yeah. So, if people wanted to get in touch with you, Dan, about your work around fish populations, how could they do that? The, beat, um, um, the easiest thing is go to my Twitter page. Daniel Walker um, on Twitter. Um, I'm also right for the Stockton Record. I do a, um, a, a column there. You can go to Stockton Record Outdoors. Dan Walker looked that up. And, and I write for the Daily Cause. I write uh, a lot of stuff on salmon. And uh, this is, and I haven't even pointed out in this, but I need to end this with the fact that this is bad. Okay, all, the situation is bad now with the way water is managed, but the governor wants to make it worse by number one, promoting the Delta Tunnel, number two, um, promoting Sites Reservoir, and number three, supporting the voluntary agreements that are, that are backed and pushed by Big Ag. Thank you very much for listening to me today. So again, thanks for tuning in. Again, I just want to make sure everybody can uh, hear. His name is Dan Bacher. That's D-A-N, last name B-A-C-H-E-R. And again, he uh, has taken time to show up today. He is one of the most knowledgeable people about the, uh, the state of California's um, fish, uh, which of course affect all of the Pacific populations and have huge ramifications even outside of California. So in just a moment, I'm going to have Patrick Corgans come up and talk a little bit. Um, and really, we're going to get right into the gist of um, what he's going to talk about with white water mismanagement, privatization. Uh, one of the things listening to Dan, though, that I really was struck with is, um, you know, uh, of course, dams in California have had a devastating effect from the potential spillway failure at Lake Oroville uh, to Shasta Dam, their effect on fish populations, but also that they're part of a very Owens Valley. They're part of a very old and crumbling infrastructure, uh, uh, including the levees that are potentially leading California into major mass flooding. So part of what we were talking about doing this uh, symposium today was like to bring awareness about uh, climate change, whether you believe it's natural or man-made, it's a combination, it's cycles of nature. But the fact that you can't deny that California has been going through mega droughts, mega fires, mega floods um, and also mega erosion landslides. Recently up on the Klamath, there was a massive erosion that happened from a wildfire there that actually 
went into the Klamath River and suffocated the river and also contributed to the death of uh, you know, thousands, if not tens of thousands of fish there. So this is kind of, um, I, we don't wanna be doom and gloomy today. We wanna to talk about solutions, but the point is that we wanna bring all this uh, to your awareness. Also, another thing that really horrified me and Patrick will elaborate is the billions of dollars that have been spent on restoring fish population on water and uh, the misappropriation of our, of our tax money and in the, these bond monies, which we're gonna really get into the, uh, the, uh, the details of that in just a moment with Patrick. So again, thank you for tuning in. Um, again, we, we, I do wanna say, you know, all of these people here uh, work very hard to do the work that they, they do. If you can afford to make any sort of donation uh, to help support us doing events like this, uh, please just go to earthstockfoundation.org and there's a button there. You can make a, a, a modest donation through Venmo or PayPal. But really, even to rent the facility today for people to get here, uh, for the gas, the flyers and all the effort, you know, these things take real world resources, including the hundreds of hours that people donate to actually do the work that they do. So, um, you know, being an educator and an activist and an advocate for water doesn't always translate to a paycheck unless you're possibly uh, a nonprofit that gets paid a lot of money to do the work that you do. Some of them are very good. Some of them are fair, fairly um, impotent because uh, they want to continue to get paid and it's not in their best interest sometimes to solve problems. So with that, uh, we're going to go to the next piece. Um, I keep seeing someone coming up on the screen. It's like a painting. Uh, again, please just make sure since we are recording that everybody's microphones are off, but we want to get to our main speaker right now, Patrick Porgans from Planetary Solutionaries. Um, he's going to talk a lot about uh, what we've been talking about, but really bring it home with details and statistics and information. And up until a few months ago, uh, I was talking to people about the snowpack, about these arc storms and mega floods. People were laughing. And it, it was very interesting in a way, I, 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 uh, a friend of mine said, well, no one knew what no one knew when no one knew what he actually knew. So, you know, right now we're seeing uh, massive flooding and with the temperatures rising, uh, the potential for um, not only flooding and, and levees failing, but also the potential of reservoirs overflowing uh, and, and it major issues with dams. So before Patrick comes up, I wanna preface that, uh, we're just gonna take a little breather and watch this a quick two minute video uh, about what's happening right now. We'll be back with Patrick Porgans. Monterey County, where a levee was breached, flooding the community of Pajaro. This is in northern Monterey County, right next to Watsonville. Streets, homes, businesses, and schools are all underwater. Don Land joins us now live. Don, exactly where are you relative to the breach? Not too far. I'm in the city of Watsonville because all the access routes for the community of Pajaro are either shut down or flooded. This bridge here is also shut down. And right now, the only folks who can cross and go into the community of Pajaro are those who are doing search and rescue operations. An entire farming community under feet of water. Drone footage shows the widespread flooding in Pajaro. Streets, cars, homes, businesses, and schools submerged. Authorities say it's caused by this levee bridge roughly three miles east of Pajara. First responders started evacuating people late Friday night. Firefighters also announced the evacuation order in Spanish, since a majority of the roughly 1,700 residents are Spanish speaking farm workers. Unlabeled workers were also going door to door to get people out. He started to pray a little bit, a little one, and the other little siblings decided to pray too. 18 year old Christian Garcia and his family were sleeping when the loud fire trucks woke them up. It didn't feel real because the sirens, everything, it was everything's in a rush. Christian's family and his uncle's family live in one house. They packed up and left. Pretty chaotic. I'm sad. At least uh, my family said, you know, yeah, we were safe for that. And my neighbors, Monterey County officials say the Pajaro River levee broke around midnight. They say the breach was around 100 feet wide. Some residents could not get out in time. The California National Guard soldiers rescued dozens of people, including this person trapped in a car. 
first responders, also rescued a woman and a little girl from a car that appeared to have been pushed off the road by floodwaters. Search and rescue workers from Oakland used their boats to look for stranded residents. Many streets are under at least two to three feet of water. It was not like uh, shocking, because I've never seen that. I've never, I've never seen that. Shocking and then, then sad at the same time. Christian and his uncle Isaac Martinez went back to check on their home Saturday morning. This is their street, Brooklyn Street. Everything's destroyed, plants, the floor, everything's destroyed. This is Christian's former school, Pajaro Middle School. Community is just sad right now, watching everything just go like that. Christian and Isaac's families are staying at a local shelter. They say given the extent of the damage, it could take months to rebuild. It's get better and better, time by time. And get everything fixed in, new furniture, new fun. I mean, hopefully, like the city can help us out with that too. Tuesday, we're expecting a lot of rain, and it's gonna get worse. And that's the fear. Things are gonna get worse before they get better with more rain possibly on the way. Uh, by the way, we don't know if there are any injuries, and we don't know if anyone is still trapped uh, in the community of Pajaro. We do know a lot of first responders working on the other side of the bridge right now. I'll send it back to you, Andre. And we sure hope everyone is okay. Thank you, Doc. And that's just the uh, beginning of what's now heating up in California as massive snow melt. We're going to share a couple short videos in a few minutes, uh, but without any further ado, I know that a lot of you have tuned in to uh, watch our next speaker, uh, Patrick Porgans. We are going to answer a few. There's a ninety percent chance your phone is already infected. AI is taking over. Um, so basically, we're going to have Patrick talk a lot about his research with uh, mega drought, mega fire, mega flood, uh, and now these new arc storms. So without any further ado, I want to introduce our keynote speaker who actually joined us at the New Living Expo last week in Marin, where uh, Jaws hit the floor and people actually found out what's really happening. And again, I want to encourage everyone, please make sure your mics are turned off, because if they're not, you could have your image or yourself uh, being broadcast as the keynote. So please, everyone turn off their microphones without any further ado, Patrick Porgans. Yeah, thank you for having me. I appreciate the opportunity to share some information with those people that are listening to this broadcast. First of all, I want to go back and reiterate on some of the issues that uh, Dan Bacher had raised. And if you don't hear me, let the uh, people know. Okay. So here, back in 2008, uh, we had what they called a salmon collapse and the National Marine Fishery Service and NOAA were saying it was due to ocean conditions. I filed FOIA requests with them and over a period of five months, they finally conceded that they did not do any QA or QC to make that kind of a, a determination. And then after I reminded them what they needed to do, they said, thanks for telling us, we'll go back and do it. So we need to take uh, everything the government has to say now with the total, not a grain of salt, a train load of salt. We need to stop listening to them because we know that since 1967, they've been talking about on the state level and the federal level of doubling fish populations, in particular, anadromous fisheries. We've spent billions of dollars on you know, purportedly bringing these fish back. And right now, as was pointed out, we're shut down again. This is unacceptable. What we do know for sure, and I only have 50 years involved in this. I have 100 fact-finding volumes on forensic reports on water, water-related toxics, you know, throughout the West, from the 100 Meridian, Denver, all the way to the coast, to the borders. I'm seeing a similar pattern all the time. What's happening is we're waiting for the government to come back and let us know what their plan is. Well, we know what their plan is. It's the dead fish plan. I did an article on that, which was in one of their San Francisco papers some years back. So what we're talking about now is what is the major cause of these fish collapse? And it's basically the state and federal water projects that are causing this problem. They have not been held accountable for killing one listed ESA salmonid species for all the years that they've been pumping down there. What happens is they come back and when it uh, exceeds the take limit, 
the authorized take limit, they come back and they do what they, they call a, a renegotiation, a reconsultation. And then what they come up with is what they call prudent and reasonable alternatives. And that those alternatives are supposed to mitigate for the impacts that were caused by the operation of the projects. Well, who's paying for the mitigation? We're paying for that mitigation. And what we're talking about here and now is not just a few dollars. What they're doing now, they, they developed this very ingenious plan where they now use our tax base, our credit rating, and our natural resources to sustain and amass their fortunes. Okay, so what happens when, if you go back in the last 25 years, you'll note that California has had an accelerated rate of catastrophes. Every time the federal, uh, the state issues a disaster uh, proclamation, they get significant sums of money from the federal government. One of the reasons why I'm wearing this mask is because the government failed to protect us from the COVID. And that could have been avoided, but that's another subject. So what we're talking about now, since the year 2000, are you ready for this? $25 billion have been spent borrowing money in the name of the people of the state of California for safe drinking water, water supply reliability, and let's not forget water for fish. We're buying water for fish. Now, it seems like a little bit out, out, of, uh, out of hand. Fish live in water. The only problem that you have here is everybody in the fishery agencies are talking about, yeah, we need more habitat, we need more improvement, but we can't get water. Now, I'm gonna show you some graphs in a few minutes where the state claims that fisheries and environmental purposes are the largest consumer of water in the state of California. Well, let's let the fish know that, okay? And the largest group of predators that are on this planet, especially in this state of California, when I was um, testifying before the State Water Resource Control Board during that last drought, I said the largest number of predators are right here in this room. Back up just a little bit. Thank you. They're the attorneys. And so what I'm talking about here now is what we need to do is stop listening to them and we need to come up with our own plan of action. We have to stop going along with any more Delta conveyance systems. We were fortunate enough back in 2018, I was a, a protestant in the, the fix and it was a fix, but it wasn't a California water fix, it was the state water fix. I have data to show beyond any reasonable doubt and the data I have is based upon government documents or where I bring in court reporters, a bond of stenographers, and I interview these individuals are the so-called public trustees. The major cause for every water war that we've experienced here in the last 60 years is the result of the Department of Water Resources conflicts of interest. One, it's a water purveyor, quote unquote. Two, it has the uh, a, a public trust responsibility to protect the resources. So the other problem that the State Water Project had is that it was underfinanced and contractually overcommitted since day one. In other words, they knew it was going to cost more than what they said it was, and we have all that documented. And then the other part of it was they contracted for more water than they could provide. So the next thing we find them doing, and I predicted back in 1985, that by 1990, we would have a major crisis, a water crisis here in California, because the, one of the major sources of water DWR is dependent on was the water that was classified as surplus, surplus water in the Delta. Well, the fact of the matter is, is that in many types of water years, we don't have surplus water. So what did DWR do? It started stealing the water. So we caught them stealing at least 500,000 acre feet of water back in 87, uh, 1990 and 1991. 218 violations of their permits. And let's keep this in mind. DWR does not own the water. This water belongs to us. This is a public trust resource. They only have a permit to use it. And those permits have terms and conditions. And those terms and conditions are supposed to be complied with. But they're not. And the reason for that 
And this is another one you got to put, you know, make sure you're, sit, you're sitting down. The state's credit rating is directly related to the state water project's revenue stream. Hmm? So in other words, if they have default on payments, which happened back in 1994, when we had a series of hearings before the Senate Agri uh, Agriculture and Water Committee, and I showed that the state water project was not only paying for itself, but we were subsidizing to keep it financially solvent. The money that was coming into the state water project was from two sources. One, it was the California Water Fund, which was the royalties that were earned off of the Tideland oil. The Tideland oil down in Long Beach, for example, was generating like $25 million a year. Prior to the time the state water project absconded with that money, that money was going for anyone in California as a resident could go tuition free to any university in the state. So they took the money and they put it into the water project. So back in 1994, during the Senate hearings, we got them to pay back $500 million. $120 million went for levy uh, improvements. That levy that broke down there in that small town is only a tip of the iceberg. Just back up just a little bit. Only a tip of the iceberg. What we know for sure now, and these are two reports, you can go online and get them, it's Arc Storm 1 and Arc Storm 2. And one was done, uh, this was a consortium of 100 different scientists, if they know what they're talking about. And they're saying, for example, if we have a mega flood in the Sacramento River Basin, it would be like the 1861-62 flood, which inundated the entire Central Valley, 300 miles long and 25 miles wide. Hmm? eight to ten feet deep in water. That happened then. The governor at the time had to go to San Francisco for his inaugural. Now, I'm saying that based on the information we have, and I've been involved in every major lawsuit as it relates to flooding, the Department of Water Resources, because it's uh, overly contracted, it mismanages the Orville Reservoir. That's the second largest reservoir in the state of California. It's up in the Feather River watershed. Back in 2017, I told them the night before the, the, um, the spillway uh, collapsed, there was going to be a problem, and that's in the record. Uh, by the way, the spillway was designed by a graduate, a graduate student, okay? And there was a whole myriad of issues and problems with the, the, the design and, and the maintenance. So moving forward, they came back and they, it cost a billion, $1.1 billion to reconstruct the spillway. The problem here is it's already cracking. The spillway is cracking. So the spokesperson, Erin Mellon, for the Department of Water Resources said, we, have, we anticipated cracks. Wait a minute. Back up a little bit. Wasn't it the cracks in the spillway that caused the spillway collapse? So she was telling everybody, crack, cracks are good. So I don't mean to be facetious, but I called her up and I asked her, when was the last time she got a brain scan? She asked me, why are you asking me that? I said, we've got to check for some cracks. Now, the spillway still hasn't been fully repaid for. The problem with the spillway is that it can release 250,000 CFS coming down the spillway and downstream from there, the levee system is not designed to handle that type of flow. Now, they required, DWR is required to come back and do what they call an inundation study to see what it would be like if there was a breach at the dam or if there were more than 250,000 CFS coming down. Under certain conditions like a mega flood, that happened, say, for example, in 1861, 1862, 1904, 1907, we can have as much <laughs> as 600,000 CFS coming down the Feather River, okay? To put that in perspective, the entire Sacramento flood control system is only designed to handle 600,000 cubic feet a second. So what does all that mean? So the Department of Water Resources comes back 
and they do a sunny day forecast to show what the flooding was going to be like. Hello, sunny day? I used to, when floods usually occur, it's during a rainy day, okay? Unless we're talking about snow melt. So the problem here becomes the downstream levee system is only capable of handling something like 300,000 plus CFS. The 600,000 CFS that we're talking about here, on an average day, the Mississippi River <laughs> empties about 500,000 plus CFS. So we're talking about a deluge. So what does all that mean? It means that 1.5 million Californians downstream from that reservoir are going to have to be evacuated in 24 hours. It means that there are $725 billion of assets in harm's way. Huh? There are going to be a quarter of a million of Californians will never be able to move back into their homes. And this is only a tip of the iceberg. The problem that we have here is they have what they call the Central Valley Flood Control Plan. I worked on that back from 1985. I told them that if they didn't do three things when they initially developed a plan, that this catastrophe is just waiting to happen. So last year, I came out with a whole series of articles talking about what the arc storm implications were going to be and the mega floods. And lo and behold, it's all you heard about for the last year was the mega flood. Okay? So the, 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 the majority of the disasters that happen here in California are associated with floods. The second one is fires. And then on from there, earthquakes and, and mudslides and so forth. I can play, I just have a quick clip here we can show people. Yeah, the go ahead. So we're going we're gonna to show a quick uh, real-time video about the mass water release from the Oroville Dam right now in order to uh, try to contain the accelerated snowpack melt. So uh, we'll be back with Patrick in just a moment. All these video links and everything will be put up um, after the broadcast. for more. The last time this happened was six years ago when 188,000 people downstream were forced to evacuate their homes and properties. KTV's John Baycar has our story of the big spill. This was necessary at noon on Friday because Lake Oroville has too much water in it to maintain a proper safety margin for massive expected additional inflows. We began increasing releases out of Lake Oroville uh, to preserve uh, storage in the lake for flood protection and risk reduction for the downstream communities. Beginning at Friday noon sharp and only for the second time after it was rebuilt, the spillway at Oroville Dam used a minimal floodgate opening and began releasing the overabundance of water down the 3,000 foot long, 180 foot wide spillway. Six years ago, the old spillway had to be rebuilt after the disastrous overtopping of the entire dam that also led to severe damage to the old spillway. In the coming weeks, much more rain runoff and snowpack melt is expected, as can be seen on the snow-capped Sierra range in the background. If too much comes down into the lake too fast, the gate would be opened and flow vastly increased while still protecting those downstream. These adjustments will be done in close coordination with the United States Army Corps of Engineers and our downstream uh, flood control partners. This requires a complex and difficult balance of managing in the new climate reality to keep supplies adequate over multi-year periods. Given the, the new reality that we're dealing with, with more extreme swings between both drought and wet conditions. And get this. We're expecting the lake to reach full capacity uh, later this, this spring and, and summer, which will provide you know opportunities for using the lake while it's full. Beyond recreation, Lake Oroville will be able to serve cities, farms, and 27 million Californians, the most important reason to build reservoirs. Oroville is the second largest of the state's huge six mega reservoirs. Combined, those big six now average 88% of their historical average water holdings for this day. Patrick. So, with more precipitation already coming, they may be 100% of normal or better when this rainy season ends in June. Tom Vakar, KTVU Fox 2 News. Okay, and back to uh, Patrick Porgans for some more comments. 
In just a few minutes, we will be taking questions. I see a few more people have joined. So just be patient while we get the information out and this video will be available afterwards along with the informational booklet. Just stand back. Mm -hmm. Okay, so let's pick up off of what Crack, Crack just was saying there in that video. First of all, no one in California, there's no 27 million people that are getting water from the State Water Project. Total misnomer, okay? If you look at the amount of water, and I'm going to put these slides up. Could you get that graph so coming up here so I can show these people what we're talking about? Essentially, the state water project provides about 3.5% of the state's entire water needs. Now, and that's giving them the benefit of the doubt because, you know, most, almost all their water is coming from surface sources. There, what, there was a current water bank that was available at one time, but, you know, Resnick and the boys got their hands on that one, so that's another issue. The Metropolitan, to give you some perspective here as to how much water the state water project actually provides, on average, it's 2.1 million acre feet of water. That's all. That's it. Okay. Annually in California, where's where's my? Oh, I'm going to do that, but your your computer. Um, two, you, have, you have to do it. Two now. six four six. Okay. No, no. It's got to be two six four six. Okay. So what we're trying to do, let me go back and step back a couple of minutes here. I'm sorry, I want, to, I want to try to keep some continuity to this, but, you know, people keep throwing numbers at us, and, you know, you ask yourself, you know, where are they getting these numbers from, okay? okay For the most part, they're fabricated, as usual, and no one's going back and questioning them, but that's what I do. I'm a forensic accountant. So what we're looking at here, and we're going to be going through a series of slides, and I'm going to reiterate on some of the issues we had discussed previously, okay? Go. So there's no, first of all, we're going to be talking about the privatization of the public trust resources. As I mentioned earlier, the public owns the water. It's a public trust resource. What's happening right now is that there's a major push by the billionaires. There's four billionaires here that own 720,000 acres down there in Orange County, Tahoe Ranch, uh, Kern and Tulare and, and further south. What they've done is they're telling us, and they pushed these bond acts, you know, you, you, from 2006 to 2018, they were instrumental in getting $25 billion worth of these general obligation bonds issued by the voters, you know, to approve by the voters. So what happens is that this money that we're talking about is borrowed money. It's coming out of your paycheck and mine and from all the taxes that we're paying here. So what, 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 they, what they've been doing is they've been taking the money and they've been using it for water supply reliability, quote unquote, safe drinking water, um, and uh, for water for fish, as I mentioned earlier. So if we look at, for example, the Metropolitan Water District in California, on average, uh, they're only providing 1.3 million acre feet of water a year. Now we're gonna go through a couple of slides here and I'm gonna get to them in a minute, but before I get there, I wanna let you know that between 2012 and 2016, they were uh, putting 30,000 acres of new almonds in a year. I appeared before the State Water Resource Control Board because at that time, in 2014, the governor issued mandatory um, water conservation uh, restrictions on the urban sector, uh, but none on agriculture. So what happened next is, is that I explained to the State Board, we can't expect, you know, for us not to be having a water problem if we're putting in 30,000 acres of almonds a year. Now almonds, there's 1.6 million acres of almonds in the ground right now, and on average, they use about three to four acre feet per acre. So it's about 4.8 million acre feet of water that's required just for the almonds. That's four times as much water as the uh, uh, Metropolitan Water District provides to its customers. The Metropolitan Water District has 19 million customers that they provide water to. Partially, about 75% of the water that the 
uh, San Diego Water Authority receives is from the Metropolitan Water District. About 25% of the Los Angeles Water and Power is also from the Metropolitan Water District. So, and as I said, they only provide 1.3 million acre feet a year. So, and if you look at the record as to how much water that the Metropolitan Water District has within its portfolio, we're talking about as much as six plus million acre feet of water. What they're all talking about is trying to increase the water supply reliability for these fluctuations in water year types. So let's move forward here. So you st slides. if you stand off to the side and talk loud, Patrick, I yeah, can, 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 can they hear me out there? Yeah, they, they can hear you. Okay. So if we look at the, go to this next graph, please. Okay. And just watch the leg of the tripod there and you can point and talk. Yep. Okay, so we're going to this graph here. And what the graph tells us, can you move it? Yep. This graph tells us how much water the state of California receives on average. Now remember average is just, is that what's that, what, that is what it is. It's just an average. It's, it, it fluctuates so much that it, it's difficult to say for certainty that's what it is. But in this graph here, it shows us that about 200 million acre feet of water fall in terms of precipitation annually in, in, in California of which about 130 million acre feet go into evapotranspiration, and, you know, groundwater, you know, and so forth and so on. So if you look at this next graph here, which I, he hasn't gotten me to the next graph. That would, should, can you put that graph up, please? Okay, this is the graph, and it shows you here, you know, how much water is being used by different segments of the, of the state. And, and basically, it's showing that agriculture, I, uh, let me stop for a minute. About on average, 30 million acre feet of water is what is applied here in California annually. 85% of that water goes for agriculture. And the, about 10% goes for M&I uh, purposes. They can hear you. You don't have to stand in front of the camera. You can okay, just talk. so basically what we're talking about here is that, uh, and then they claim there's a, a, a certain percentage, 32% for wetlands and in-stream flows. That, we're going to show how that's fabricated in one minute. So moving to this next graph here. These are the uh, nine uh, hydrological areas in the state of California. And the most productive are the North Coast and the Sacramento River Basin. These particular uh, uh, hydrological areas below that are dependent uh, you know, significantly on the water that's coming out of the Sacramento River and water that's coming from the Colorado. All right, and there's some water that's coming in from the Klamath, uh, from Oregon into the state of California. Now, if you look at this North Coast um, graph, it's showing that <laughs> almost all the water is being used for environmental purposes. Well, there's really no dams up there, uh, with the exception of a few dams, but there's no major water storage dams up there. And the few dams that are being taken down there, they have some water, but it's not that significant. So. Let's rule that out of the equation. So when they say that the majority of the water is being used for in-stream purposes, tell that to the fish. So here we're looking now at the Sacramento River Basin. And it's showing all this water here, which is greater than all the other uses of that being demanded in the Sacramento River Basin. Well, again, that's not true because we know one of the reasons why the fish are not making it out to the ocean is because the water that's purportedly designated for them is not getting for it, getting to them. They're getting sucked up at the pumps. Now, the State Water Resource Control Board does not monitor what's going on at those pumps. The EWR provides them with the information. So here again, as I said earlier, we caught them stealing. I'll give you the new means by which they now abscond with millions of acre feet of water through their uh, sister agency, the State Water Source Control Board. So moving forward, in this basin here, on average, about six to eight million acre feet of water are exported uh, via the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project. Now what we're looking at here is the groundwater basin in California. This, this is the groundwater basin in California. Now, according to DWR's data, there's about 800 million acre feet of water sitting underground, all right? And about 50% of that is, we can get at it. 
But the problem with that is you go deep. And this is one of the problems that's going on down in the valley now. They're going deep, and it's affecting all of those other smaller communities because their wells are getting sucked up and dried out. Now, there was a recent report that was done by the auditor's office, which showed that about one million Californians are now uh, without safe drinking water. They're drinking water that's you know, laden with toxic chemicals, causing cancer and so forth and so on. Now, I did a fact sheet uh, a few years back and I showed that since the enactment of the uh, Clean Water Act back in 1972, here in California, we spent as much as $50 billion, this is federal money and some state money, on Clean Water Act programs, drinking water, so forth and so on. Well, in the what they call the 303D listing, uh, which is required under the, uh, the Federal uh, Clean Water Act, it showed that there was a 179% increase in toxicity in the state's waters. Now, wait a minute. We spent all that money, and we find now that, just keep that graph up there for a minute, we find now that the toxics are worse than ever before. Now, in California, I've done fact sheets on uh, agricultural pesticide application. On average, there's 200 million pounds of pesticides that are applied here in California annually, all right? Now, there's only 100 million acres of California, and most of that is in the forest and in the desert. So it's mostly being applied here in the Central Valley. So if you take that number, 200 million pounds, that's working out to a significant amount of pounds we're breathing. So I had I, I met with the I went back to Washington D.C. back in the 80s and early 90s and said, what are the synergistic effects associated with um, the uh, combination of these uh, chemicals with the photo uh, chemical reaction uh, due to the uh, thermal uh, inversion that we experience here in California? Well, they don't know. Now, recently they're starting to do some research, but they're so far behind the curve. We need to stop. Who's buying? Who's making this money? And why are we continually maintaining, oh, by the way, excuse me. Well, as you know, a big part of agricultural research uh, in California is at UC Davis, and a lot of the research is funded by Monsanto and Syngenta, which of course is tied into the whole GMO industry and, and hybrided seeds. So of course, you know, we start to follow the money, the resonates, we start to see who the culprits are. Yeah, and that's the other issue we've got to get to. Right now, we need to stop the flow of money because they're not using their own money. They're using our money, okay? We're, we're now paying them to contaminate our lands, to destroy our fisheries, and to take our water. We're paying them. So I'm not, I'm not tolerating that, okay? And I'm naming names, and I'm telling you who they are, and you can go online and find out. Now here... Hold on one second. And that's why we want to provide all of you with the what can you do links. We have a one pager that all of you will get at the end of today's uh, symposium. So you can disperse that to people and let people know so that we can start to uh, get more collective effort because the thing is we're all very divided and myopic. And I do want to emphasize that uh, everything you're hearing today is not polarized around left or right or politics. It, we're, we're getting down to the forensic uh, research and the actual numbers and details of the money and the water usage. So again, we want to give you the tools today to carry the torch for uh, this 40 some odd years of work that Patrick's been doing uh, and Dan and others that will be speaking in a few moments. So I just want to remind people that we are going to get all those deliverables at the end of today. Okay, so now let's look at the amount of water that's been appropriated in California. As I said, there's only 70 million acre feet of uh, runoff and in the um, I'd say the major reservoirs, 120 major reservoirs, we can store about 43 million acre feet of water, which this year they should be, you know, pretty much full. So then we have the groundwater, which I mentioned earlier. See, the way it works uh, is that in a wet year, quote unquote wet year, or normal year, uh, we have 60% of the water we're applying, that 30 million acre feet, are coming from surface sources. 40% comes from the ground. So I want you to go back to the other slide for a minute. So uh, again, then when you have a drought, it's the, it's in the inverse. It's 40% from the surface, 60% from the ground. Now, this particular graph here 
I got under a public records act request from the uh, State Water Source Control Board back in 2007. And it's still apl applicable to this day, uh, except they probably allocated more water. But in essence, if you look at all the water that has been issued for uh, license, uh, permits and licenses, it comes out to more than 500 million acre feet. Now again, remember, I said 200 million acre feet fall and only 70 million acre feet a runoff, and out of that runoff, we're not getting capturing all that water, right? So here again, the state has over-appropriated the water. Now some of that water is duplicate water because, you know, they use it for generating power. And here again, PG and all these other people and the state water project contractors and the Central Valley water project contractors, do you know how much they paid for the actual water? Are you ready for this? Okay, this is the same water they're selling us back that we're using bond money to buy. Now, I'm not counting the reservoir, I'm not counting the conveyance system, that's all part of the, re, you know, the repayment obligation. But the water itself is F-R-E-E, -E, free, okay? They pay nothing for the water itself. I have that all documented. So moving forward. I am monitoring Zoom on another computer. If you do have any questions uh, for Patrick as he's speaking and you want to kind of archive your thoughts, feel free to do that in the chat so we can make sure that um, as the day goes on, we're more interactive and answering any questions or unclarities you might have. Okay, so move to the next graph if you would, please. So here, this is giving us some indication as to what water sources are coming from where and this was in you know, a so-called uh, uh, a normal year. So here again, they're telling us 25% is in-stream uh, uh, uses, environmental purposes. <coughs> That's wrong. Uh, the groundwater they're saying is 22%, and the state water project, you can see right there, is 3.5%. And again, as I said, that's, that number skewed. Uh, that, that's high. Uh, it's 2.1 million acre feet that they provide annually. That's it. So moving to the next graph, uh, I'm going to show you that back in uh, December of 2022, uh, we have the drought mount up here. Excuse me, can you put this next graph up here? Yeah. This, 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 uh, this uh, shows us in December of, uh, of 2022, on December 27th, this was the extent of the drought uh, according to the Department of Water Resources. And here in January of 2023, this is what the drought looked like in California. Now, right up until March of this year, the Governor Newton was saying that we still have to conserve water because, you know, we're in a drought. Now, we have both a drought uh, disaster emergency in effect, and we have a flood disaster in effect, okay? Now, here again, the Governor just came back and he's asking the federal government to give us some more money for the anticipated flooding that's going to occur from the snow melt. Now these are billions of dollars now we're talking about here, and then they said four billion was gonna go for drought relief. And now, back a few years ago, at the Irvine Duck Club, that's owned by Donald Bren, uh -huh. he owns one third of Orange County. On DWR stationery, it said, come to the Irvine Duck Club and we'll show you how to get your free money. huh? So here we are down at the Duck Club and they're giving away all this money. This is the bond money that we're borrowing in our name. Now, every time you borrow money, like for example, in the Bond Act, as I said earlier, 25 billion issued from 2000 to 2018. Unfortunately for the Sierra Club, they've stepped in and they stopped the Jerry Merrill Bond Act, which was going to be another eight point something billion dollars and everyone that's involved the billionaires, and again, Resnick, you know, um, Boswell, um, Tahone, uh, you know, and, and, uh, and Westlands, uh, Cone Water, they were all signed up on that, providing money so that they can get that bond act passed. So what I'm telling you now is that it pays to have disasters here in California. And this is another way that they can supplement, for example, water supply reliability. Now, another good thing the Sierra Club did was back in 1999, they got a bill passed that says you can't build out unless you have a, a firm supply of water. Hmm? Now, those four landowners I was talking about was Donald Brand, Boswell, uh, Catalyst, which is the Tahoe Ranch, and Blackwell Land. 
Okay, they have 720,000 acres of, you know, already approved master plans between the four of them. So this almond scam, let's move forward to the next uh, slides. Now I'm gonna show you something here. This graph says, if you remember, the Department of Water Resources and all the so-called water experts, and I'm spelling that now with quote E hyphen P-E-R-T, that's an expert, okay? The experts claim this was the worst drought in 500 years. Well, their own data shows that the 2021 water year, and these water years are usually a year behind times. They start in um, October and they end in September. So they said this was the worst drought in five, uh, 1,500 years, 500 years. It's the third worst drought, okay? And again, what were they doing before that? Were they, in every major drought that I monitor, they export more water in the first years of those droughts than any other time in history. Then what they do is they empty the reservoirs up in the north and come back before the State Water Resources Control Board and get what they call a temporary urgency change petition. So what does that do? That means that those water quality standards that were adopted purportedly to protect the Delta are relaxed. And it means that the department does not have to push out that much water, and that's more water that they can make available to their contracts. It's at the expense and to the demise of the Delta farmers and also the public trust resource, salmonids, and those three-inch fish that everybody's been talking about. So I want to move forward to the next graph. So this is me testifying before the board. I know who I am. And here we show from 2005 to 2015, we're showing that there's a significant increase, about 30,000 acres uh, of almonds a year. Now, I want to point out, I have nothing against, you know, the nut jobs, okay? What I do have a problem with is 80% of these nuts, these almonds, are being exported. So in a sense, we're exporting our water. We're exporting our energy. Do we need to supply the world with almonds? When last year, it showed that the almond prices took a precipitous drop and they knew that was gonna happen. So where, what does all this mean? If you're putting in permanent crops and you increase water supply reliability at the expense and to the demise of the public, that means in the future, these guys down there with those 720,000 acres are gonna have more water to build out their multi-million dollar ranchettes. That's what this is all about. So let's move to the next graph. Now let's look at what's going on in California during these droughts. Now this is the worst drought in 500 or 1500 years, whatever it is. It shows here, this is the GDP, okay, the gross domestic product. On the, on the planet right now, in the developed world, California has the fifth most productive economy on the planet. So last year, I believe it was somewhere about uh, 2.7, 2.6 billion dollars, trillion dollars, which, which is what the uh, GDP was. If you look at this graph, all during these droughts that we've been talking about, the only drop you see right here was when the COVID hit, right, back in 2000. But ever since, even during this drought, the GDP is going up. So now what does agriculture contribute to the GDP? Are you ready? It's less than 3%. Now, of course, there's secondary you know, effects. You know, you put, the, you put the rice in rice cakes or the, the almonds in almond bars or whatever you got. Yeah, there's more, there, there is a, an economic multiplier. However, agriculture does not contribute that much. If we cut out just the almonds alone, we can save as much as 2 million acre feet firm yield, firm yield. That means like if you put a reservoir in like Sites Reservoir, which is a rebranded um, failed plan, which I worked on back in the 1970s and 80s, which was called the Glen Complex. It was gonna be an 8 million acre feet of uh, storage, and it was gonna be pumping water out of the Sacramento River up a thousand feet and dumping it into that basin there in Calusa and Glen. Well, as it turns out, there's 120 inches of evaporation there, and the issue was, was there enough water there in order to come up with uh, the water that they were talking about putting in it? And there wasn't, and it was, a, it was a fiasco. The same thing they tried down in the, um, with the Los Banos Grandes project, which would be adjacent to the San Luis Reservoir, and we showed them why that didn't work, and we stopped that one. So moving forward, 
we're looking at here's the bond acts that were approved by the voters unsuspectingly. I'm taking 1996 out. I was there. Here's how they made the determination on that 900. And $95 million. I was there at uh, the, the uh, antechambers uh, of the Speaker Pro Tem, back at uh, Bill Lockyer. I was in the, the antechamber and I was told to come there and witness what was going on. I have this recorded. In Smith Barney, uh, Kern Water, Westlands Water District, everyone you know, Boswell's representatives were there in this room, which was not a meeting, there was no cameras, there was no recording. And they're standing around and they're saying, how much more do you need? This is uh, Smith Barney. Give me 200 million we, we're in. Uh, how much do you need over there, uh, uh, MWD? Uh, give us uh, 150 million, we'll work. and so forth and so on. It started off at 200 million, it went up to 998, and they wanted to keep it less than a billion because it sounds like 99 rather than uh, a billion. That's how that got started. And the reason why that got started is because when I had the hearings before the state legislature, I showed that the project was not paying for itself. So this is the way they're supplementing the adverse impacts associated with the project and having us pay for the mitigation and the damages they're causing. Now, let's step forward to the next one. This, this uh, one of a series I've put out about 15 fact sheets. And these fact sheets have, you know, um, hundreds of, of, of footnotes and references and links. But at any rate, it showed that after $50 billion of expenditures, the toxics, this, all that red up here, this is toxicity, okay? And they're not even really taking into account the toxicity that's going on down in the valley. Now, the problem we're having in terms of the San Joaquin River, you know, as I showed you earlier, there says there's water for fish, but we know that the San, the San Joaquin was dried up not too long ago. There was no water at all. The other problem is, is that both the Central Valley Project and the State Water Project were supposed to build drainage facilities, okay? The terminus for the uh, Central Valley Projects uh, was there at the Kesterson Natural, uh, Na National Wildlife Refuge. That's what they were pouring the water in there. And as we all recall, back in 1982, there were tens of thousands of migratory birds that were killed as a result of storing that there. It was not the State Water Resources Control Board that came and shut them down. It was the uh, Secretary of the Interior that shut it down. Hold up. He was concerned about having a migratory bird lawsuit filed on him. So moving forward to the next thing. Uh, I want to go to this slide. So what they did, the state, now again, there was also the uh, 1992 Central Valley Improvement Act, okay? And in that act, they were saying they were going to increase fishing, add Najma's fish populations, double them, okay? And that was part of that legislation. Well, we're going to show you what happened there also. That was another failure. But in the interim, the state joined in, and they came up with what they called the Environmental Water Account, right? So if you look here, it's telling you where they use, they call them assets, you know, water assets, all right? So to make a long story short, it gives you some indication as to what this particular water was coming. So here they're saying pumping restrictions. Okay, there was nothing on the pumping, uh, pumping restrictions. But even when they weren't pumping, they were being paid for the water they claimed they weren't pumping. Huh? Okay, so anyway, it came out to be 500, over $500 million of water for fish. So then I said, Where's the QA and the QC on that one? How many fish, salmon, we, did we actually save as a result of that $500 million, which when you add the interest in, it's a billion dollars. No QA, no QC, no one could say for sure what happened, okay, if anything. So here again, this is the slide on the doubling of the anadromous fisheries, fisheries. And back in uh, 2008, Dan Barker was there with me, I did it on the first in-depth analysis to show there was a relationship between the water year type and the amount of water that was being pumped and the amount of fish that were being returned. There's usually a three-year cycle on that. So if we went back to the former slide, we show that most of that money was from 2000 to 2006. That's what the, the, the data shows. So if we're looking at 2000, 2001, 2002, 4, and 6, these fish would be coming back there, right? So look at the population decline. 
Now, this was all, and, and the enviros went along with this. I, I opposed it because I said, if you look back at the history of the Central Valley Project, they never enforced the 160-acre limitation. That's how these guys made all their money down there. And in order to enforce that, the Westlands Audit District would have to say somebody's using more water than 160 acres because the federal government doesn't enforce it. And by the way, right now, the Delta Mendota Canal and the facilities there at the federal pumps are no longer being operated by the Bureau of Reclamation. That's over. That's being um, uh, administered and managed by uh, the Delta Mendota water uh, personnel. Now, every so many hours, they, a half hour, 45 minutes, they go by and look at the portal to see what many fish are going by. Now, these guys are not fishing biologists, okay? However, they're the ones that are telling us what type of <laughs> baby salmon just went past, okay? They're telling us that, right? Okay, yeah. So anyway, we don't know anything about what they're talking about because they don't know what they're talking about. So let's get somebody down there that knows what they're talking about and take some of that same bond money and hire an independent fisheries person to go down there and do the monitoring. Okay? That's what we need because, again, this is all their data. Oh, yeah, we, we killed this many fish. Today. That's not happening. I just want to add something. So again, I want to just welcome a few, a few people just joined us. We're watching the Water Symposium live from Sacramento, California at Connect Sacramento. Uh, we're listening with Patrick Porgans, who's going through a forensic breakdown of what's happening uh, with our tax and our bond money, what's happening with the uh, privatization and mismanagement uh, of our state water. Uh, the whole farce of the drought and also we heard from Dan Bacher recently who was talking about the massive fish die-off and the complete collapse of uh, commercial and sport fishing in California. So we're going to switch gears a little bit because we're going to start talking about the idea of mega drought, uh, mega fire, mega flood and these arc storms. So before we get into the arc storms, I just want to remind you, if you have a question, put it in the chat. I'm monitoring Zoom so we can ask Patrick or Dan or other people who are here. Uh, but before we do that, I just want to share uh, very quickly a video uh, uh, that just came out about the flooding in California. And we'll be back in just another moment with Patrick Porgans. We begin with that deadly flooding emergency right here in California. The state facing another round of heavy rain after a devastating parade of winter storms. 11 million people under flood alerts across the West through midweek. The unrelenting rain turning towns into rivers. Emergency crews rescuing drivers trapped in rising floodwaters after a levee breach in Monterey County. Thousands of residents forced to leave their homes. Here's a satellite image of that so-called atmospheric river bearing down on the state. The system massive in size, higher elevations facing even more snow and dangerous winds. This section of Highway 1 in Big Sur forced to shut down after a catastrophic landslide caused severe damage. Another storm system wreaking havoc in parts of the Great Lakes into the Northeast, causing hazardous road conditions in Erie, Pennsylvania. ABC's senior meteorologist Rob Marciano leading us off tonight from the storm zone. Tonight, first responders rescuing stranded drivers from life-threatening floodwaters after a levee breach in Monterey County, California. Rescuers going door to door, warning residents to leave after a 100 foot wide breach in the levee on the Pajaro River. More than 8,000 people forced to flee. These families stuck on a bridge waiting for transport to nearby shelters. 11 million people under flood alerts tonight. Dramatic new drone video showing a raging river tearing through Kernville, California. Look how violent that water is. Officials ordering evacuations in Kern County as well. At least two deaths have been reported. California and Nevada declaring states of emergency. The entire West struggling to deal with the 11th atmospheric river event, dumping up to a foot of rain the past week. In Santa Cruz, heavy rain causing massive flooding and damaging roads, stranding residents like Gabby David. Can't go to work and can't do um, everyday normal errands. This section of Highway 1 and Big Sur forced to shut down after this rock slide damaged the road. Water pouring over the side. For the first time in nearly four years, they're actually releasing water from one of the state's largest reservoirs, rolling down the Oracle spillway at 8,000 cubic feet per second. 
And in Lake Tahoe, historic amounts of snowfall, another 32 inches in some areas. People who have been here for a very long time have said this is more snow than they've ever seen. A separate system marching from the Great Lakes to the Northeast, bringing heavy snow to Pennsylvania. So let's get right to Rob Marciano in Folsom, California. And Rob, the state bracing for even more flooding. Yeah, the rains were ramping up again. We even had a tornado warning earlier with a funnel cloud spotted. So we've got it all. Flood watches remain in effect. Winter storm warning, warnings remain in effect up in the mountains. And the rains will increase tonight. We'll really come in on Tuesday morning. That's when the next atmospheric river, that's when the next deadly flooding potential is going to be in this state. Now, the energy from yesterday's atmospheric river triggering severe weather tonight across Little Rock. Tomorrow, that gets into the southeast along I-10, Mobile, Montgomery, and then through Tallahassee. And then that'll trigger a storm along the coast for Monday, Tuesday. Tuesday along I-95 and Nor'easter developing here, mostly a wet snow and rain along I-95, but another heavy wet snow event with uh, high accumulations inland. Whit? All right, Rob, we know you'll be tracking it all. Thank you. Hi, everyone. George Stephanopoulos here. Thanks for checking out the... So, again, I know that, uh, you know, Patrick's been talking about mega drought, mega fire, mega flood, and these arc storms for a long time, and uh, we've seen that come into fruition over the last uh, six months here in California with the uh, atmospheric river, several of them. Uh, they're actually predicting more snow uh, for the Truckee area and the Sierras, and also uh, many of you have seen uh, that even a lot of the inland low-laying val valleys uh, are now turning, like uh, Tulare, uh, the whole area is now actually an inland lake like it used to be, because at one point from uh, from Redding all the way down through Central Valley used to be uh, one of the most incredible wetlands uh, in North America, which has all been drained and dried. Uh, and, and we're going to talk more at Patrick right now, but I just wanted to really drive that point home because, you know, when I talk to people about flooding in California, they, they, they think that it's, uh, it's completely impossible in a farce. But as we take a forensic look at all this uh, research, uh, and what's happening in real time, we can start to see. And in a little bit, uh, we're going to start to talk about uh, some of the solutions and people we can contact and things we can do. So with that, let's go back to uh, Patrick Porgans. So what we're, what we're going to lead off with going back one step here. And what we're saying is that every major water project that the Department of Water Resources and the federal government have proposed in the last 60 years are just a rebranded rendition of a failed project that they had proposed previously. So if you remember, back in 1994, we had the Bay Delta Accord. The Bay Delta Accord came about as a result of those hearings that we had before the Senate Ag and Water Committee showing the project would not pay for itself. So the enviros, along with the other NGOs, the conservation groups, and the water um, rustlers, got together behind closed doors and made this agreement. The agreement then you know, morphed into uh, the, uh, what they called the CalFed process. That was a consortium of about uh, 25 different state, and federal, and local agencies that would come together. And, and this was going to be the be all and end all uh, to resolving the uh, imperiled conditions of the Bay Delta Estuary, which is the largest remaining Bay Delta Estuary on the west coast of the Americas. The Bureau uh, was successful in killing the one that used to go down from the Colorado River into the Sea of Cortez. So moving forward now, the CalFed process went on from 1995 to 2006, and the former executive officer Joe Grindstan testified that you know it was essentially not the program we had envisioned. It was a failure. Six point five billion dollars later, and that's not counting the interest on that borrowed money. Now be mindful that these costs that are going into these various projects like the BDCP, the California Water Fix, and now the so-called um, um, conveyance uh, system improvement, the Delta Conveyance Improvement System, is all part of the same scenario. It's now the one tunnel. So what happened in 2018, while I was attending the so-called California Water Fix, we found that DWR and the Bureau and, uh, and the State Water Resource Control Board personnel were meeting behind closed doors. And they were conjuring up what they were going to say during the proceedings. That was a, a violation of the ex parte communications. 
That spurred, that public records act request that I made spurred a whole series of lawsuits going after them to find out exactly what happened. And so forth, right subsequent to the 2018, uh, where the state board said they were going to approve uh, the Bay Delta Water Quality Control Plan for the San Joaquin River, uh, they didn't take any enforcement action because the governor said, let's do this by a voluntary agreement. Well, now it's 2023. That was 2018 in November. We don't have that voluntary agreement. And as I wrote stories about this, previous voluntary agreements do not work. They're done behind closed doors, and most people don't have any input into that. And that's, again, voluntary. Now, if you're out there taking water illegally, you're going to be fined. And, you know, it could be if, if you take one fish over the limit or you snag a salmon, you, that's a federal offense. But, you know, if you're killing them at the pumps, and it's a government agency, they're not held accountable for killing anything. And we come back and pay, as I said earlier, to get those fish um, uh, purportedly some water. So now moving on to the, uh, the arc storms. Earlier when I said this arc storm one and arc storm two showed the extent of the damages that we're talking about, it also mentions that 20 to 40 of the levees in the delta could, could be inundated and, and levees breaks all over there. As we move forward, this is, this is what a picture of the arc storm looks like. If we move to the, uh, to the next slide. Now, I mentioned earlier about these inundation maps that the government is required to provide to the public as part of their emergency you know, um, plans of action. Now here, this is with a breach at Oroville Dam, okay? This is DWR's rendition of what would happen with the breach. This is the area they're showing would be flooded, okay? That's the sunny day forecast. Now, a reality check, this is USGS, along with those other 100 scientists, showing this is a rainy day breach, and this is not with the dam uh, breaking or giving way. This is with water overtopping the dam, or that amount of water I mentioned earlier. This entire area in blue, all the way down here, all the way out into the Pacific Ocean, is going to be impacted by a megastorm. The only thing that saved us this year is the fact that the soils up in the, in the mountains were dry, right? So this coming year, the soils are probably going to have still a, a lot of moisture. So if we get back into a, a series of these arc storms come next water year, the probability, based upon DWR's historical operation of the reservoir, what they do, there's a certain amount of storage that's provided at the reservoir at Orville. The water contractors don't pay for that. That's paid for by the taxpayers. It's 750,000 um, acre feet of water storage. Even as early as March this year, they were holding back 200, they were using 200,000 acre feet of that space and only releasing minimum amounts of flow through the generators. If we had gotten another arc storm, a major arc storm, we could have had that event that I was talking about earlier, right? So they admit in their own document, Bulletin 199, that it's tempting to hold back on releasing water for two reasons. They can generate more power, and two, it can increase the amount of water they can provide to their contract. They're doing that at the risk and to the demise of the people downstream. Now, in the 1986 flood and the 1997 flood, they were doing that. And I monitored the reservoirs on the west, fly, west side of the Sierra, uh, Sierra Mountains from 1985. So I know what they're doing when they're doing it. And if they're not in compliance, <coughs> I notified the Army Corps of Engineers. However, the Army Corps of Engineers has no enforcement power the enforcement powers up to DWR. They monitor themselves. Now, even though they were found at fault for those two floods, and there were billions of dollars in damages, neither DWR nor the State Water Project contractors paid for those damages. That was paid for by issuing commercial paper and general obligation bonds. So even if they're wrong, they're not held accountable. So we have a situation here where this has to be changed, and we're working on that right now. So move to the next slide. Again, this was a portrait of what the uh, spillway collapse looked like. It was a mess. Now, the reason why they held back 
on releasing water as the water was coming into the reservoir. And be mindful that was not the result of an arc storm because four days prior to um, February 7th, the total amount of rainfall that had come into Oroville was about two inches. That was it. It, was not, it wasn't a lot of water. And subsequent to that time, it was maybe four to five inches. However, the water was building up in the reservoir. And the reason why they held back for three days, I could have flown over that with a UAV and told you in a half hour what the depth and the, the scope of the problem was. I could have done that. However, they were concerned about the power plants becoming damaged. So they sealed that area off. And that was one of the reasons why they held back. Now, the other problem we had here, and here's another reason we got to go after NOAA, the National Reef Fishery Service, Department of Fish and Wildlife, and then the rest of them, the resources agency and the state board. The problem with all of this stuff comes back to something very simple. <clears throat> when you have a condition such as the one we're witnessing there, you have to ask yourself, how does it get to be like that? Now, what about the emergency action plan that they have? I asked them to give us a copy of that. That tells us what we should do when it's an emergency, right? Are you ready? They said it's classified under national security. We cannot give that out. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So I asked, who's the PR person that put that together? I need some help from them. Because this is, so anyway, they gave them less than 24 hours to evacuate up there in Orville. And some of them had to evacuate three times. Some people were on life support systems. Huh? And so in one instance is, back in the 97 flood, DWR was supposed to show up before the Office of Emergency Services. And they were thinking 400,000 CFS was coming into the reservoir, right? And, and they said, good luck. And they couldn't be found. They couldn't, no one could reach them by telephone. DWR went for the hill, the bunkers. huh? So by, by the way, when I'm saying these conditions we're talking about, you can have a standard project flood up at Orville with 440,000 CFS coming in with a 1.5 million acre feet coming into that reservoir, okay? And that's in 72 hours. Now that's just the standard, the maximum probable flood, 72 hours, is 720,000 CFS coming in. This is all related to the arc storms, by the way. Because if they're not prepared to deal with this, and they're using flood storage space in advance, right, of one of these systems coming through here, that means there's going to be less space there to provide for flood protection. So they're playing Russian roulette, okay, up there at the reservoir. That's what it comes down to. So the last part of that equation is you would have 720,000 720, CFS coming in, and you would have 2.5 million acre feet coming into the reservoir, okay, in 72 hours. So moving forward, we're looking at the issues of public trust. We'll go back to this slide here. Okay. This slide here shows us what's going on in the uh, central, uh, Sacramento Valley. This is the water year types that occurred from 1970 through 2018. So you can see that droughts do occur, uh, but you know, for more, more or less, that we're, these are uh, above normal, uh, these are above normal. Uh, this, this is an extreme flow. Like, look here in 2018 or 2017. 37 million acre feet of water huh, came out of that into the Sacramento River Basin. Again, that would be enough to fill almost the whole 120 reservoirs that hold 43 million acre feet. So then we go from 2018 to 20, uh, uh, 2020, and they're talking about when a major drought. Can, can, you, can you talk about the analogy where you said, um when they declared the drought, but yet California could have six to eight feet of water. Can you just give a visual of that? Oh yeah, what happens is, is that in the event that these kinds of conditions occur, we could be inundated in the valley up to six, to eight, 10, 12 feet of water as a result of, of an arc, a series of arc storms coming in here with wet conditions up there in, that, uh, in, in, in the, uh, the headwaters. So uh, I'm gonna move forward to this next slide here. So what's happening now is what we're looking at, going back to the funding scheme. Funding scheme works like, let's create a crisis. It's crisis management in California. 
There's nothing proactive about it. It's all reactive, okay? You let it happen, then you come back and you throw a lot of money at it. You don't resolve the problem, and that's obvious from the droughts that we witnessed just in that previous graph. Then they come back and they wait for the next drought to come, and then they go back into, we need more water development, we need water supply reliability, we need more clean drinking water, so forth and so on. So essentially, what we're saying to people, can we afford, because the cost of living in California is going off, it's off the scale. We're paying more for less, the quality of life is being impaired, and the cost of living is going up. So when all that water conservation took place back in uh, 20, uh, 15 and 2016, there was a total of about um, 3.2 million acre feet of water that was saved. Now, 1.2 million of that was in the urban sector. So what happened? The people in the urban sector that conserved water wound up paying more for less water. Okay? They're being penalized. Why would that happen? So now we need to go back after these water districts and find out why they're selling water to Westlands Water District and other areas down in the San Joaquin Valley that are loaded with toxics. All that drainage water is being stored in the soil profile or they're dumping it into the Delta, Delta Mendota Canal or even the California Water Aqueduct. This is where they're pushing these toxins or they're coming down uh, through the San Joaquin River, through Mudslow, into the Delta. So that's a water quality impairment problem. And it's not going to be resolved if we allow them to continue irrigating lands that we know have known problems. So move to the next slide, if you would. So this is a book we put out, it's Truth Decoded. You know, I, I want, if somebody's out there to show me how to put this up there, I'd, look, I'd give it to people for a dollar, okay? I don't make any money off that book. The people that, you know, put the books out there, but it's online. Uh, Amazon and all those other guys. Anyway, this is our contact information. And we can move forward can to you, the can next you just, one. Can you just uh, slowly say your information for people if they want to get in touch with you, please? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Excuse me. It, there's two emails you can go to. One, you can go to the website. It's uh, www.planetarysolutionaries. P-P at P-L-A-N-T-A-R-Y solutions S O L U T I O N A R I E S dot org. <coughs> or, you, as I said, you can go to the website, which is www.planetarysolutionaries.org. And then you can also go to pp at porgansolutions.com. I'll spell that one out pp at P O R G A N S S O L U T I O N S dot com. And then you have our um, phone numbers there, which you can see, and our PO box. Great. Okay, so a nice uh, round of applause for Patrick Corgans. A lot of, a lot of information to uh, take in, but I think the fact that we can see how uh, the state, you know, creates these supposed droughts. Uh, they're using it as a way to privatize water. Um, and the whole emergence of these mega drought, mega flood, mega arc storm scenarios. And really, we could see through uh, some of the media support uh, and other uh, information that Patrick was sharing, the potential of massive uh, flooding and infrastructure issues all throughout California. Uh, you could see the map from Central Valley all the way from Redding down through Central Valley all the way to the Grapevine. Um, north of Los Angeles. So we're almost to the end. Um, if you want to get up and just stretch for a minute, we do appreciate uh, your attention. And I do want to say I put uh, the information I'm going to share in a second, I just put it into the chat so you can download this, you can share it because, you know, we can sit here and give you all the information that you can use uh, as a tool effectively to make change in the state uh, and in your own life. But it's also nice to have it where you can share that and get other people to start to understand uh, what they can do. So uh, this today really has been a call to action to contact the following agencies uh, and also to protest the destruction and privatization of publicly owned natural resources at all of our uh, expenses as uh, citizens here in California. And really, Californians need to take action to stop this uh, immediately, the exploitation of our natural resources. Uh, and we've talked a little bit about approximately the $26 billion in uh, general obligation bonds that have been approved 
uh, for supposedly for uh, clean water, safe drinking water for fish, etc. Uh, total being more like uh, in the 50 billion, and it's only gotten worse. So um, we're starting to uh, you know pull back the curtain and expose some of the agencies and people that are really lining their pockets uh, and mismanaging our, our precious resource of water. And not only uh, mismanaging it, but making huge uh, criminal level uh, profits. So one of the things we're saying what you can do is you can educate yourself about the situation while we're doing this symposium today. You can contact various agencies from uh, natural resource agencies, Department of Water Resources, the Director of California Water Commission, the Department of Fish and Wildlife, Fish and Wildlife Commission, Department of Food and Agriculture, uh, and also request an investigation by the State uh, Auditor's Office on the State Water Resources Control Board, California Environmental Protection Agency, and the California Coastal Commission. Uh, in um, addition, uh, we are asking you to don't approve any more general obligation bonds for supposed good uh, works because uh, they're not being successful. And this is information we have available here at the symposium today. Um, just you know, to be aware, do your own research, but to follow the money and be aware where it goes. Um, we also want to say that you know, if you do support nonprofit organizations that are supposedly doing good work around water in California, uh, to do a little bit of resource re research and actually find out how much water actually goes to getting things done, and again, not just paying um, uh, board members to uh, to to try to keep shuffling the papers, which also helps them to maintain. Uh, their job security. Uh, also demand that the officials uh, enforce and not select selectively the laws that are in place around our water protection. Uh, and also things you can do as a consumer, you know, stop purchasing almonds and pistachios and pomegranate products, Fuji water, and all these things that are, are connected directly to the Resnix. Uh, term, uh, terminate patronizing major banks too, such as Wells Fargo, um, uh, 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 Bank of America, Chase, and investment firms such as Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs that are also uh, making record profits in the privatization of water. I mean, they actually call water uh, the new gold. And there's a lot of other things you can do, but I did put that into the chat. Uh, we're getting close to the end of our program for today. And again, um, in the chat, you can look because uh, not only is what can you do available, but um, we also put our email because all of this is fueled by community support. None of us are on the board uh, or, or uh, of a nonprofit that are getting paid a salary. Uh, none of us are getting any sort of kickbacks for this work. Uh, Patrick is a researcher. Uh, Dan Bacher is a journalist. And Bob Saunders, who's going to come up in a minute, is an ad, uh, ad advocate and activist here in Sacramento around many issues. And here he's going to talk for a few minutes about environmental toxins. But before we have Bob Saunders up, I just want to remind people that um, for me, my, my biggest passion starts with people taking personal responsibility. And that starts with uh, the horrific amount of toxins that we're, uh, most of us are contributing to by poisoning uh, our watershed. Uh, and that really starts uh, at home with household products, cleaners, detergents, uh, soaps, those types of things. Uh, it extends out into our garden with our landscaping, our lawn care. Uh, I see people still to this day using pounds and pounds of, of Roundup and glyphosate for uh, weed mitigation, which has been proven to be um, a cancer-causing agent. Um, also connected to Monsanto and the University of California Davis and Syngenta, Syngenta and GMO seeds. And then other things like um, like in Beale Air Force Base, where they're doing constant research around forever chemicals as fire retardants with this new uh, whole legacy of mega fires that are happening right now, too, that are contaminating our watershed and, and making all of us sick. I actually just saw Dr. Michelle Perot at the New Living Expo um, recently, and she's been doing a lot of work around uh, making people aware about heavy metals and glyphosate and other toxins that we're unknowingly or just lazily or uh, stupidly using and contaminating our environment. And then we have, again, industrial ag, which is horrific. Again, the soul of the Delta film. I was working on with Bob in the Delta after doing 50 interviews. We were about to release it, and we were actually um, 
put the brakes on because a lot of the people we interviewed who are involved in agriculture in the Delta, none of them are organic and they're all contributing to the toxification of our water. And it's just one of the sad realities of industrial ag. Uh, of course, some of the mines like the Idaho Maryland, uh, Maryland mine in Nevada City is threatening to reopen. There's a big fight going on there. Of course, fracking, record amounts of fracking going on uh, even with uh, our current uh, governor. Um, who uh, sometimes appears to try to have a more green uh, disposition, uh, the, the runoff from livestock, and of course microplastics are, are huge, sewage landfills, herbicides and pesticides, a major one, the geoengineering, and again, like Patrick was saying, you know, millions of people uh, in California who, who don't get uh, clean water. So I'm going to go over to Bob Saunders in a minute, but I think someone had a question. Well, I just I just want to have a correction on, on fracking. Um, the, the fracking has slowed down considerably in terms of granting uh, new and reworked permits. That's happened because of the pressure environmentalists on on Newsom. Um, the the main problem is that the the uh, calgium, which is the oil gas regulator, continues to approve hundreds of uh, new permits every quarter and has, proved, um, has approved over 14,000 permits since, night, or since 2019 when the governor became uh, um, or entered office. So, so the fracking has slowed down definitely. There's still fracking going on, uh, but the, the regulators aren't giving new permits. Um, but the oil drilling and gas drilling keeps going on. In fact, the uh, a large percentage of the of, hey, of, you did. that were granted were in, uh, in, in uh, 3,200 foot safety zones, okay, mm -hmm. that where, where oil is blocked a bill that was passed by the governor and, and um, or passed by the legislation signed by the governor that would impose health and safety back, uh, setbacks, but it's been put on hold for for uh, almost two years, you know, it will, um, at least till November 2024. And they're continuing to approve permits in those zones because the oil drillers know that if their their uh, initiative on the ballot or their, or their uh, referendum- uh, I'm gonna get back to you Monday. The reason I was waiting because I was, um, is something that I was going to get, you know, that I'm all right, I can hear someone talking in the background. Uh, so we're getting to the end again. That was Dan Bacher just kind of give us giving us an update on the state of fracking. So with that, I'm going to invite up uh, Bob Saunders and uh, Bob. Yeah, you um, know, he's, he's not in the mail yet. You don't go in the mail either. Uh, in Sacramento uh, for many years for many uh, important issues that uh, sometimes, uh, you know, some of us are too busy to really sink our teeth into. So uh, I'm going to call up Bob Saunders before we, while he's coming up to get ready, I'm just going to share this last video. And again, uh, thanks for, for hanging I'm having a great time. I'm feeling great. And... I can hear someone talking on the side. Records and surpassing snowpack levels in recorded history. According to data from the California Department of Water Resources, CDWR, the Southern Sierras have officially hit a recorded high, currently holding a snowpack 257% greater than the annual average by April 1st. The entire Sierra Nevada range is well beyond anything seen in the past decade, with the yeah. Central Sierra reaching 218% its annual average for early March and the Northern Sierra now sitting at 168% its annual average. This has been one bender of a storm cycle, said the inertia's Wilsilio. We've seen it all, from sneaky powder afternoons to whiteout conditions, massive over powder mornings, and seeing as it's now March, a couple ill-timed days of spring slush as well. For reference, California had recorded 64% of its average April 1st snowpack as of the beginning of 2023, which accounted for 174% of the average snowpack for the first week of January. This is similar to the conditions in 2022, when snow levels were above average but dropped off significantly in January through March. However, this year, the faucet never shut off. 
As of this weekend, the Southern Sierra now appears to have the largest snowpack in recorded history, as measured by Snow Water Equivalent, or SWE, wrote climate scientist Daniel Swain. Not just for the calendar date, but for any date. Charts tracking California's snow water content show that the Central and Southern Sierra are both at historic heights for their annual average at this point. The previous record-holding winter was exactly 40 years ago in 1982, and the current winter has surpassed those levels. The Lake Tahoe area has seen insane numbers like 52 feet of snow, with a big chunk of that number coming as February turned to March and Tahoe saw 8 feet in 7 days. The same storm brought 93 inches to Southern California's mountain high, which typically only averages 67 inches in an entire season. Despite the heavy snowfall, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Sacramento District announced that they are monitoring Lake Isabella and Dam and that the current rainfall is well within the capacity of Isabella Lake. They estimate that reservoir volume at the conclusion of this event will be between 230,000 to 270,000 acre feet, and they do not believe they will need to use emergency spillways at this time. In the unlikely event of a spillway release, both the emergency and service spillways are fully functional and ready to release water as safely and manageably as possible. We encourage all local residents to heed evacuation warnings from local authorities, the Army Corps of Engineers said in a statement. They recommend visiting the Kern County Emergency Services website for updated emergency information. The heavy snowfall has brought joy to skiers and snowboarders, as well as relief to California's ongoing drought concerns. However, it has also caused road closures and power outages throughout the region. Residents are advised to stay up to date on weather alerts and heat evacuation warnings as necessary. Great, and I would encourage you to check out what's happening at uh, Lake Tulare, which is a ghost lake that's now taken over uh, one of the most prime uh, agricultural and livestock areas in California with massive flooding. And with that, we're gonna talk a little bit more uh, about privatization. And uh, I know uh, Bob Saunders worked uh, years ago when Nestle was tapping the uh, headwaters up in Mount Shasta and was involved in the recent uh, battle with Crystal Geyser, pulling out a half billion bottles of water a day out of the aquifer. Uh, and he's gonna kind of give us an update on that. So thanks again for, uh, for joining the Water Symposium this afternoon. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you, Michael. Hi, my name is Bob Saunders, and I've worked on a lot of issues regarding water and um, with the Crunch Nestle Alliance, where we shut Nestle down four times. We also assisted the folks up in Mount Shasta to kick out Crystal Geyser, which they successfully did after about a nine-year battle. And um, where Crystal Geyser wanted to, they had a plant nine miles away. They wanted to build another one, Mount Shasta, take over the old Coca-Cola bottling company plant. And they would have been extracting um, f approximately three and a half billion gallons of water per day. And um, we also worked with uh, the anti-Monsanto project where we shut Monsanto down uh, eight times and costing them a lot of money and driving their stock down. We were so successful that we drove them into the hands of Bayer, who bought them for $64 billion, the exact amount of money that they lost in, uh, in, uh, on the uh, stock market. Anyway, um, I want to read this, this quote that I wrote. The search for free-flowing free potable water, a necessity of life, has been a constant issue in many regions of the world and often throughout history. Many cities are constructed around the availability of water from nearby rivers, lakes, and streams, sometimes to their detriment due to floods and things like that. Today, our supply of available water is under siege, not just due to the elements of nature, man-made contributions and misuse, etc., but often by the sheer theft of water by various and greedy means and nefarious political deals throughout the world. I wrote that in 2015. And with that, I also wrote a white paper for our Crunch Nestle campaign and um, what we talked about, too, is and at that time, uh, there was the, the crucial climate change talks in Paris. And as the world's leaders were meeting and discussing things, what you could do and who has a responsibility and who's not holding up their end of, of responsibility and accountability, et cetera, and all the other bullshit. And then they ended up walking away from there, having agreements and did absolutely nothing. And they haven't done anything for eight years. Everything's gotten worse, unfortunately. 
Um, uh, we, along with several other environmental and social justice activists in Sacramento, uh, we shut down Nestle's Waters and uh, Alhambra Water Company. Why did we shut Alhambra down? It's much smaller than Nestle's. Because it was right across the road from Nestle's. We did a twofer. Um, you know, and because we were really opposed to the, uh, and wanted to combat the company's destruction of vital water supplies. Nestle's was getting water after they got kicked out of McLeod, California, Northern California, near Mount Shasta. People in Sacramento did not know that uh, the uh, city council were sending members there and um, who is it, business associations were sending people up there to say to them, hey, they don't want you in, Mount, uh, in McLeod, why don't you come down to Sacramento? And so they secretly built a plan there and in fact somebody who was the, uh, an assistant chief of staff for um, Kevin Johnson at the time um, resigned and a week later went to work for Nestle's. And um, so there's a lot of background. It was a, and I know from uh, who's a Kevin McCarty, who was a city councilman at the time, said that he was the lone vote that said to them, Aren't, isn't this illegal that we're not even having a public meeting, that we're, this is like a backroom deal? And he said they, he was the only one who was in opposition to that, and of course they went ahead and did it. But Nestle's actually was granted the opportunity to get a 750 uh, um, a gallon truckload, like uh, what you see, like the oil, the silver oil truckloads of it. it. Just imagine that with water rather than oil. So they did that and they got it at 65 cents per 750 gallons. And they were allowed to extract something like um, 80, 80 million gallons a year. And they were paying 65 cents, which is about what we, we're paying at home. I have nothing against any company that wants to use water to clean their machines and things like that, or you know, but it's absurd when they get it at the same rate we do, and then they charge anywhere from 10 to 1,000 percent more on the bottles. And a lot of it, what they're doing is it's two aquifers down in the south area, at which and Nestle's has a history of draining aquifers and picking up stakes and leaving. They did this in a town of Pennsylvania that was devastated. And, you know, and of course, if you don't want them, they'll go to the neighboring town, but use your roads to get there and everything. Your taxes pay for those roads. They don't really care because, you know, essentially, where's the government on all, all this? And we'll get that into ju just a second. So, you know, basically, you've got companies, Nestle's, Alhambra, Crystal Geyser, Coca-Cola, PepsiCola, Niagara Bottling Company. They all contribute to the massive usage of, uh, of water extraction and profiteering and then also the plastic, uh, you know, toxic plastic uh, garbage that they, that ends up filling uh, you know, the great garbage patch in, in the Pacific Ocean and everything else in between. Now um, in, what was it, this was from 2015, so it said in 2015, 27 years ago, Nestle's when uh, they found out, somebody did an expose, they found out that Nestle's had been uh, violating a, uh, op and operating without a permit for 27 years, taking water from the San Bernardino National Forest, which is a national forest land, and taking, uh, they were taking 68,000 gallons of water per day. And actually, at that time, there was a drought in California. And so what do you think happened? So a lawsuit was filed against the federal government regarding that issue. So what do you think happened? Okay. Nothing. Nothing happened. They said to them, you bad boys, you shouldn't do that, but you've been doing it for 27 years anyway, <laughs> go ahead and do it. And this is eight years later. So, you know, so essentially that goes into what, like Michael said, and what, uh, um, what Dan had spoken about in that way and what Patrick said also about what you can do. And the thing is, I believe as an activist is what you can do is show up. Like I said, when they were having climate change meetings in Paris, the whole, all the world's journalists were there and everything, we were shutting down two plants in Sacramento, taking action. Because it's not enough, what they do is they pay attention to when you do that. We also wrote, um, well, I'll get into that in a minute or two. Um, I want to talk about the privatization of water. The privatization of water, whether partially a part of long range and complete plan by bottling companies, has been around for quite a number of years. Most likely, it was kind of, in our modern day, I would say it started around the 70s. 
when little more, little by little. Today, the American people you, um, drink about 50% about of all the water they drink is bottled water. Nestle's control is about 35% of the market. They got out of their candy and confectionery business about four years ago, and they got into bottled water. So you're seeing more and more of flavored bottled water, and some of the brands you see, you don't see Nestle's name on it. It's made by Nestle's, or it's made by a subsidiary of Nestle's, or Nestle's will go ahead and be the distributor for it, whatever, because it's about you know just mass sales and, and exposure and shelf life and all that. Masked, masked. Mass. Mass. Oh, mass sales, yeah, right, very good, I like that, double entendre. Um, anyway, uh, many mega corporations have gotten the game of buying water rights, just like the oil, oil barons of the past. These new water barons, Wall Street banks, elitist multi-billionaires, uh, multi-billion dollar conglomerates, whether in the United States or overseas, you know, where, where they're headquartered, they've been buying up water all over the world at an unprecedented pace. This is 2015. Uh, it was about three years ago, I believe, Michael, where they said that uh, water would now, or actually two years ago, water would now be traded on the stock exchange. And essentially, they were looking at water as a commodity for years to be bought and sold. And you had Peter Lamath, who was the CEO of Nestle, said a couple of years ago, water is a commodity, um, and access to water should not be a public right. So <laughs> I had a poster and I had a picture of, over him. <laughs> It was very interesting. I think there was like an arrow pointing at him, like, you know, kind of like an arrow by a, a tribal person that would shoot at him, or something like that, because that's exactly what he, I mean, basically, these people are trying to kill us. And they're trying to deny our rights to our, our water um, by uh, nefarious means. And according to the Center for Research on Globalization, and again, this is 2015, familiar me mega banks and investing powerhouses such as Goldman Sachs, J.P. Morgan Chase, Citigroup, UBS, Deutsche Bank, Credit Suisse, Macquarie Bank, Barclays Bank, the Blackstone Group, Alliance, and HSBC Bank, among others, are, were consolidating their control over water. Wealthy tycoons such as T-Bone Pickens, former President George H.W. Bush, and his family, because they have a lot of incestuous uh, involvement between oil and water with the Saudi Arabian government, uh, Hong Kong's Lee Ka Ching, Philippines uh, Manuel Pangilinan, and other Filipino billionaires and others are, were buying thousands of acres of land with aquifers, lakes, water rights, water utilities, and shares in water engineering technology companies all over the world. Water is the new oil, says oil man and corporate rate of T. Boone Pickens, and every, just about everybody's heard about him. I mean, that's what these people do. I mean, it's sheer arrogance and hubris and entitlement. They have a sense of entitlement. And why? Because like Patrick has talked about also and has pointed out and demonstrated in his years, years and years of work is because the government lets them, lawyers, they get their lawyers to do it. But mostly, a lot of it really comes down to people don't fight for their rights. If you don't fight for your rights, they'll, they figure you don't need them anymore. You know, you're not you know, what's the big deal? It's when you stand up and go back, they take notice. And then, of course, you get the press involved. That's why we always would get a press release, write fact sheets and things like that to get them to show up for stuff. And, you know, there were miraculous things that happened and stories that came out that nobody had been reading anything like that for years. Change is difficult, though, truthfully. But if you don't fight, you don't do something, you'll never get change. And a second disturbing trend besides what the... That sounds like an accident. Yeah. Uh, the second disturbing trend is that while the new water barons are buying up water all over the world, governments are moving fast to limit citizens' ability to become water sufficient. Let me say that again. While the new water barons are buying up water all over the world, governments are moving fast to limit citizens' ability to become water self-efficient. Imagine that if you were able to draw a well and you, you third generation, um, all of a sudden they say, you can't do that anymore. If you take water from that well, we're going to charge you, you know what, for taking water from your well for your own property. And they can actually do that if people don't fight back, because that's essentially where things are, we're heading. As reservoirs and groundwater reserves were rapidly diminishing, water profiteering industries and the new water barons continue to drain 
our water, make enormous profits, leaving little behind for the rights of people and a public trust, water. And water is a public trust, even though they want us, you know, the government comes in and buys our water and then trades it, I think they should have to ask permission. Um, the other thing about it is, so in 2015, Americans drank more than 10 million gallons of bottled water. Uh, it was about three to three and a half years ago. What ended up happening is they said that water, um, bottled water has now, uh, bottled water sales has now increased, I think at that time it was 0.3% more than soda. And so, it, and, and now I believe it's even higher, of course, and if you include juices and soda, it's still significantly higher. Um, because we were, we were fooled. I mean, we were told that the water coming out of our tap is poison. You can't drink it. It's got all this stuff. What they didn't tell us was you can actually buy a filter to filter out a lot of the crap that's in there. But what they don't tell you is that it's the FDA that is uh, the, has oversight over bottled water and there's arsenic in every type of bottled water. And uh, they have other elements in there also. There's, um, what is it, fluoride in there, and a lot of it could be excessive. So essentially, the EPA has much stronger regulations, even though I think they, the EPA, Washington, D.C. Suck, suck. I call them the Environmental Permit Office because they issue permits to all these people to do these constitutional violations and, and uh, you know, uh, other, other things that are really against the people and our, and you know, our rights. But the other thing about it, too, is that they, they, um, they issue the permits that actually let them do that. So, I mean, they're pretty useless. California's EPA is better, but, you know, not by much. But anyway, so, so it's absurd. So, in a sense, it's because the FDA regulates it. They're looking at, like, the color of water. So you can have brown-looking, murky, crappy-looking water. They could put some minerals in it, and if it's clear, and it meets some, you know, bottom, bottom standard, that's good enough. In Walmart, if you ever checked where the water comes from, a lot of times puts their brand label on it. The water comes from um, the, it says, bottled at the Modesto. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, well, not quite, but they're, they're better than that. Bottled at the municipal water supply in Modesto. So they're selling every time somebody buys uh, um, Walmart water, bottled water, they're buying water, especially the people down in Modesto, they're buying their own water that they actually can get for free. And if they use the filter from the tap, actually it would be cleaner than the bottled water. But you know, but that's how absurd it is. I mean, you know, and a lot of it has been done through advertising, false advertising, scare tactics, and things like that. So people really don't know. Um, as I mentioned, there, you know, and also there are very few environmental controls of any kind re regarding that. They don't really test it. You know, Patrick had, um, no, Dan had mentioned something about that early on about it. So you really don't know what's going on here and they've done everything or they've hired people that don't know aren't really scientists to test this they like train them take this kit go out and do this why because you're not going to ask questions it's kind of like if you hire it's sort of like if you hire dumb people dumb people are just going to say well i'm just doing my job just tell me what to do i'll go do it and that's it no questions asked no harm no foul yeah um but anyway, so uh, the other thing is that there are massive amounts of, uh, oh, let me get to Crystal Geyser. Yeah, Crystal Geyser, uh, a couple of years ago, was sold. They used to be in Calistoga, uh, California. Now they're owned for the past couple of years by the Atsuka Pharmaceutical Company of Japan, who are the makers of Ambien, uh, a drug that killed people. And also they at one time were, uh, had made a, um, uh, what was it? It was a, um, a pregnancy prevention uh, device for women that killed women. So, you know, they have a great history. You really want somebody like that to be in charge of water. But what essentially what we did in a lot of ways through this, whether individually or as a group, we went up to Mount Shasta. We helped them have an event up there. We went ahead and uh, stopped help them stop 
uh, they did the primary amount of the work over the years, helped them stop Crystal Geyser from building a plant there. It's still vacant at this time. The other thing is, you know, we, I worked with some people up in um, uh, Portland, Oregon, and, you know, sent them a copy of a press release, fact sheet, um, and, and also white paper, and talked to them on the phone a couple of times and helped them kind of really solidify, you know, um, organize and protest. And um, because uh, Nestle's wanted to build a plant there, and actually ne I found out later when I once got a call from this elderly woman who lived 10 miles on the Washington side, I forgot the name of the town, and said, are you Bob Saunders? And I said, yes. And she said, could you help me? And I said, what do you need? And she said, you got to help me stop Nestle's, like you guys are d trying to do in, um, over there. And you know, you, I heard, heard about you guys just stop uh, Crystal Geyser and stuff. And I said to her, well, what's going on? She said, well, they want to build a plant. I said, yeah, in Portland, right? She goes, no, they also want to build one on our side. I said, so they want to take water from both sides of, of the gorge? And she said, absolutely. And I said, oh, we have to stop that. And I said, how do you get along with your ranchers and your farmers over there? And she said, well, you know, sometimes ranchers and farmers. She goes, I'm into like environmental stuff and you know all that. And I said, if you get your, if you get some ranchers and farmers to come into your house and you just have some coffee and some, some pastries and stuff like that, I'll, I'll drive up to, I'll drive up to you, uh, to Washington and I'll go talk to them. I said, I can get along with ranchers and farmers. I said, because if Nestle's comes in, they're under siege. They're as much under siege as everybody else. And when Nestle's would suck water from an aquifer and it's gone, what are those ranchers and farmers going to do? People have to start thinking about not it's me against them, it's this group against that group. It's all of us. I mean, you know, you can live without food, you can't live without water. And people need to start doing that. And, you know, they, their whole livelihoods, like Dan talked about what happens to the tribal groups, this would be, you know, predominantly white farmers and ranchers over there that are like, she told me, third generation. And then on the Nestle's, uh, on the, excuse me, Portland side, they defeated them. And finally, it took about three and a half years. Nestle's, it was a report, I got a call from her. Um, it was gold, it was, I think, Goldenberg, I think it was Goldenberg, Washington. She called me, she, she said, Bob, I'm on vacation, but I had to tell you, there was just an article in the paper, but I heard it three days before, Nestle's quit, uh, fighting to build a, a plant here. They're going to close shop and, and, and move. And so I said to her, I wonder where they're going next to destroy it. I don't, they didn't really go anywhere in the Pacific Northwest there. Um, they have some influence. They sell their stuff all over. A good portion of Nestle Pure Life that's made in Sacramento at the plant down on, um, off of Fruit Ridge Road. A good portion of it, like maybe about 70%, is sent out of state. How do I know? Somebody I know, I think Dan may know her as well. She was at her mom's house in Michigan, and her mom says, oh, would you like some water? She said, sure. She thought her mom's going to give her a glass of water. Her mom takes out a bottle of Nestle Pure Life. She said, mom, what are you doing with that? <laughs> She's an environmentalist. And then she tells her, that's made in Sacramento. They're sending it over here. It's the same thing like Patrick had talked about almonds and pistachios, the Resnicks, Boswell, all those people. 80% of the, uh, of, uh, they use a tremendous amount of, of water. 80% of all the almonds that they grow here, and I believe pistachios, are shipped overseas. So we continuously keep paying to have these manufactured shortages and that they pro prosper up and, they, and the stocks go up and everything, and, and we keep voting for these stupid bonds. And they're, they're, they're screwing us two, three times over. It's time to wake up. And you know, one of the things is, like Michael said about what you can do, and I mentioned Patrick as well, is we have to fight back. I mean, you know, part of it is educating ourselves. Another part is boycotting. You know, and the key thing is pick one, pick a Nestle's company, you know, pick somebody like Nestle's and tell 10 of your friends, don't buy any of their products. Tell, I go into supermarkets. I was in Redley's last week and I, and I was talking to somebody and I said, you guys sell um, wonderful pistachio nuts here and stuff. Do you know they're made by the Resnicks? And he, he said, who are they? And I go and I tell him, he said, really? He said, well, my friends and I like, like pistachio nuts. And I also went in a Safeway store and I said, but you guys sell your own brand. I don't buy 
wonderful, but I still get pistachio nuts. I just buy a, diff a more a local brand. And, you know, I said, you could do that. And then I tell them about bottles. Of I always figured they're going to kick me out of the store. But I did that in New York years ago when I heard when I, when I was a kid and I heard about the lettuce strike out in California. I go up to somebody who was the A&P and a couple of other local stores in Brooklyn, New York. And I said to them, do you know what, what's going on here? How poorly they pay workers and stuff? And I start talking to people on the right and left of me, women shopping and things like that. My mom had sent me to the store. I really thought they were going to kick me out, but they didn't. But the key thing about it is, if they did, I would have been kicked out proudly. So the key thing about it is you can't worry about repercussions of your actions. You have to take action. I believe it was um, uh, Howard Zinn who said, um, voting in a democracy, voting is, is a really good thing to do. He said, however, it can never replace direct action. And that's what we must all do. You know, can't, can't just be keyboard warriors. You know, got to take you know, the next step. And I told Patrick, anytime he wants to go to, you know, has to go or want to go to any of the water agencies, I'd be honored to go with him. I mean, I'll just, just so that he doesn't have to go alone. You know, and if they feel like, you know, hey, who, who's this guy coming back again? You know, whatever like that, we're tired of hearing him. You know, of course, they're tired of hearing speak truth. I'd be one of those people, I'll be one of the other people that go along. You know, Dan would go along too, so would Michael, you know, and the same thing. And that's really what we have to do. You can't do this alone. We have to work it, talk to your friends, talk to your neighbors. You really got to get people to wake up because we, like the Amazon rainforest, has passed a tipping point. Um, there are things that can be done to bring things back because of technology and the brilliance of people if they apply that, but how much we can come back, I don't know. You know, it's, it's questionable. And when? So, thank you. All right, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Uh, Bob Saunders. So, uh, we have one last presenter, and he's going to talk a little bit about um, uh, neonicotinoids. And, uh, you know, uh, a few years ago, I did some work uh, for an event in Oakland at the Gardens of Lake Merritt. And I got an opportunity to um, work with some people that were doing a lot of work around pollinators. So many of you may or may not know that pollinators are really the link to our food security. Um, and more and more that we use uh, herbicides and pesticides and various types of things, not only are we impacting water, we're impacting our food security. So again, this is, you know, can spiral off into many different areas of advocacy and education and activism. Uh, we're trying to stay focused today specifically on water um, and to give you the tools uh, and, and really the weapons that you will need to go out to actually make change by having the forensic information, the numbers and the data in front of you because uh, that is what will speak. Uh, it's not, you know, in the age of fake news and conspiritualism and all of these wild uh, ideas of dismissing things, uh, you know, facts and science do still speak. So with that, I want to introduce our, our next and our last speaker, uh, and he's going to give a little discussion about his work here in Sacramento. Uh, I'd like to wear, welcome uh, Harry Eldridge. Uh, Michael, thank you for having me. Hello, everyone. Glad you're all on the panel. Glad you're all listening. So I teach biology here in Sacramento. Uh, I've worked across the economic and cultural spectrum that makes up our student population here. We're one of the more diverse cities in the whole country. It's been a joy working with students across the spectrum. And I myself, um, I, I grew up in the scientific method, learning how to do a lot of research. And over time in my life as an adult, I've shifted to what I call the sonic method, that uh, vibrant ecosystems have a sonic resonance. And when you're in a, in a vibrant ecosystem, such as a marsh with cattails, you should hear red-winged blackbirds. You should see frogs. You should see herons, egrets. You should see swallows chasing insects. So applying that here to Sacramento, we had, as you all know, a massive amount of rain this winter. And the, the American River flooded over its banks into the floodplain. And I've been canvassing the American River quite a bit. And I want to say there is variability along the American River. Where I walk is mostly between Howe Avenue and Watt Avenue. We have some backwater sloughs and channels there. And you see very few egrets and herons there. 
you hear very few kingfishers there. When you inspect the shallows, and by inspecting I mean sometimes taking my shoes off and walking into the shallows, you don't see insect larva hatching there. That's why you don't see swallows chasing insects. Now in other areas you do see some swallows. I've canvassed some other areas as well. But the premise here is to be in your common sense. And if you're looking, listening, and feeling, what's interesting, CPR, you know, when you learn CPR, it's the same thing. Look, listen, and feel. And if we actually do that with the environment, engage our friends, and bring our younger generation up, just come out to the river with me and walk. Let's just sit still for a while. What do you hear? I remember I took my son. I used to live in Santa Rosa. And uh, there's a new park over there called Mount Taylor Park. It's right on the east side of 101 in southern Santa Rosa. And I said, Landon, I want to just look at this suburban neighborhood before we go into the park. We'll just sit and look. Uh, brand new homes, maybe a year old. And I said, we're going to walk into Mount Taylor. We're going to look at some of the logs and the birds and the decay and everything. And then we'll stop by this neighborhood on the way out. And so we had a nice walk for two or three hours. And we got immersed in the wind and the trees. And uh, we came back to the neighborhood. And I said, well, let's just sit for a minute. <laughs> And I said, what do you think? He said, Dad, it's dead. I can't hear any birds. I don't see anything really alive other than people. And I've learned through the discourse, environmental discourse, not to vilify anybody. This is a big orchestra here, right? I, I don't have a car now. I've driven a car, so I'm not going to put a do no harm sticker on my car. The iron ore for that car came from somewhere, so let's all be awake. But let's minimize and let's be in our common sense that when you're in your common sense and you actually feel invited here as a species we're invited here okay we have a sense of belonging here our hands are our gift and our excess at the same time so back to this theme of what can we do so we had a question earlier about pesticides and glyphosate so there's been a good amount of research done uh, Xerxes Society, which is the Entomological Society, has done a number of good studies on neonics. So it turns out that neonicotinoid pesticides, they come out of the nicotine family. It's a metabolic disruptor. So not only do they affect bees, but they affect the macroinvertebrates, which are the insect larvae underneath the leaves in our rivers. And this is the bottom of the food chain in our rivers. This also affects salmon. And I've made a couple calls to people in the fisheries, uh, fisheries agencies, and it's kind of like neonics are flying under the radar. I was a little surprised because uh, the scientific literature has been out there since, excuse me, 2015 on that carnage, and I'll use the word carnage, lethal and sublethal effects from neonics on macroinvertebrates. So back to my, my sample walking area uh, between there's, there's another area between the REI and the Costco here, which is a huge field, mm -hmm. and it fronts on the American River on one side, on the other side it fronts on the bike trail. And I took a walk, and again, I'm not back there trying to do a scientific study. I'm listening, I'm observing, I'm being in my common sense. I heard two hawks over six hours. Fifteen years ago, I would have heard a multitude of hawks. Then I looked, do I see any fresh mounds of dirt for gophers, any voles? Couldn't find any fresh mounds of dirt. Now, mind you, some of this area was flooded, so I went to the areas that were higher above the ground. I looked for spider webs higher above the I couldn't find one web. And this was also affirmed by another walk over in West Sack on the Yolo side. I called Patrick one day this winter. I said, this winter, I said, Pat, what happened to our worms? I don't see the profusion of worms on our sidewalks. Usually they coat the sidewalks in the wintertime. And we both concurred on that. And then I went to the computer, looked it up. Well, if neonics are percolating through the soil column, as they have since the late 1990s when they first started being used, they're not just percolating anymore. They're actually in our rainwater. So again, they're coming down, they're going through the soil here in Sacramento. And uh, so these ancillary effects. So then the question we're all looking at is how do we establish restoration? What do we do? And that's where our own individual behavior comes in. We're accountable for our own behavior. We're accountable for what we buy. I do want to mention if we eat less meat in this country, that's one of the best things we can do for our water supply. Bring your meat intake down to two times a week. 
you don't have to go cold turkey. I mean, if you're vegan and it works, fine. But if you meet, need meat a couple times a week, but just reduce meat. The amount of corn and soy that's grown in this country, I think it's as high as 80%, that goes to meat production, chicken or cows or pork, all right? And the amount of oil it takes to produce that, to transport it all. Um, so we can make conscious choices. And as I came over here today, uh, I always have my antenna up. And of course, the seventh game of the Kings and the Warriors was on. Mm -hmm. And I thought of somebody asking me, are you a king or a warrior? I say, I'm neither, right? I'm here as a humble servant. And we have to look at these myths and these paradigms that were given to us to digest that we say, no, no, that's not the myth I believe in. Because where, where we often get stuck in men is being a king or a warrior. And really each one of those, I mean, the warrior has a validity, but if you don't have a five speed on the floor, that's where a lot of us get stuck. Mm -hmm. So uh, we have to look at some of these semantical themes that were given as well. And I'm just very thankful to everyone in this room uh, that's here and the elders in my life that have helped me be in my common sense. Thank you, Michael. Yeah, so ne neonic contamination. Once again, on the scientific literature, neonic contamination in California waters, you will see an abundant supply of scientific literature there. Thank you. We got a colony collapse. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, some inspiring words. We're just going to have a last quick little 60-second uh, report from Patrick. He had the last comment to make. But I do want to remind you, um, again, a lot of energy goes into making these events and these broadcasts happen. Uh, we appreciate any support. You can go to earthstockfoundation.org. Uh, there's Venmo, PayPal, make a donation. And again, everything takes energy and time. And I hope that in some way today you are inspired through the science, through the information, through the research, through the dedication of these amazing people to actually be a, uh, an instigator of change. It is going to take us all starting in our own within our own self, within our own home, our backyards and our families and our neighborhoods and communities. But we're also at a very uh, transformational time on the planet and it is gonna take everyone's effort. We can no longer just count on uh, civic leaders or government or uh, elected or potentially elected officials to make the, the decisions for us or potentially do the right thing. Um, it really falls in our hands as um, uh, citizens uh, here uh, in, in the United States. So um, that brings up a whole other thing about the whole sovereignty movement, which I've been working on with Marsha Willardson. But just to finish, we're going to have Patrick share a comment. And uh, if there's any last questions, I'll monitor Zoom, and that'll bring us to the end of today's water symposium. So back to Patrick Porgens. Uh, thank you. <laughs> the important thing to realize now is we have an investigation going on uh, by the auditor's office <coughs> into the policies and practices of the Department of Water Resources and the State Water Resources Control Board. Uh, <coughs> their practices, according to uh, members of the Joint Legislative um, Audit Committee, are not only dangerous, they're hazardous to the people of California. That audit report is coming out shortly. If you go on the auditor's uh, <coughs> website, you can get that report. There are also a number of reports showing where this bond money is being misappropriated. A lot of these major organizations um, are getting bond money and they can't account for how that money is being expended, okay? So we need to go back and look at that. The other thing we need to do is we have to go back and see who's sitting on the board of directors of all of these multinational uh, organizations, EDF, NRDC, and all those other, other uh, lands for conservation, public trust lands, all of those, the Coastal Commission, all of those entities are half the, the, there are audit reports. You go get them, they're free, okay? The Truth Decoded Book, what it does, it talks about common sense is senselessly uncommon, okay? What we need to do is exercise our inalienable rights. No one gave that to us, that's ours. That's ours. And if you don't exercise them, they're lost, okay? So I'm, I'm one person and the other people here are one, individuals, but we're individuals that make a difference. When I go there, I, I, I try to work with them in the government. If they don't do their job, I'm going after them and I'm going to get action. I don't, I don't back down because there's, there's, there's what's left. We need to do something and we need to do it now. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you so much. And uh, it looks like there's, um, I'm going to check if there's any questions from anyone right now. 
And um, yeah, so I would say just uh, I want to remind you to email us if you'd like to get um, some of the information. I mean, Patrick has put a lot of effort into putting together these amazing uh, booklets, which give you all the information. Um, I also want to talk about uh, again, if you if you look up what's happening right now with the uh, the 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 flooding in Tulare Lake in California, which was a ghost lake, which has now come back and. They're saying that it will basically devastate a majority of California's agriculture for years. Uh, and also, we want to make people aware about the proposed sites reservoir project, which is another uh, horrific idea of how to mismanage and privatize uh, California's water. So I'm going to finish with the video. And again, I want to thank all of you for joining today. I want to thank Patrick Porgans from Planetary Solutionaries. Uh, Dan Bacher, journalist from Fish Sniffer and, and you know, many publications, uh, Bob Saunders, Harry Eldridge, and also others uh, that came here today. It's good to see some familiar faces who uh, assisted us with the Water Palooza event we did at the Wright Hotel a couple of years ago to try to bring uh, more awareness. And uh, we're not giving up, but we need more people. We need more support and we need people to um, get uh, activated and to get into some level of advocacy, uh, even if you're not an act activist, advocacy can also be a great way uh, to bring more awareness and to help make the changes that we need here in California. So um, again, I want to thank everyone and we'll finish here with the sites reservoir video, uh, we'll take, which will take us to the end of our broadcast. And then if you are interested, this broadcast will also be available um, to share with others uh, after today. So again, thank you so much. Thank you, um, uh, Yoshia, come, calling in from uh, uh, Placer and Yuba County and, and Steve and all the other people who were able to join uh, the broadcast today. Um, you have the ability to make the difference. Thank you, uh, Petra, and uh, much love and appreciation. And we have to do this to make the changes uh, so that our children and generations to come have a, a world to live in. So thank you. Whole of America, standing at a height of more than 200 meters, while the reservoir holds hundreds of millions of cubic meters of water. Another famous example is Pyramid Lake, which sits just outside Los Angeles. During periods of drought, During periods of drought, the water collected in these giant reservoirs can be sent to farms and cities. It's an impressive process, which relies on a massive network of canals, aqueducts, and pumping stations. Some of the water travels hundreds of kilometers and even crosses mountain ranges. The most famous component is the California Aqueduct, which carries water all the way from the Sierra Nevada to Los Angeles, branching off to serve millions of people along the way. At one point, the Edmonston Pumping Plant has to lift this water over the Tehachapi Mountains, a height of 600 meters. It's like trying to pump a river over the top of the One World Trade Center. No other pumping plant in the entire world lifts water higher than the Edmonston. Overall, it's one of the most advanced and ambitious water management systems in the entire world. But at the time of construction, in the 1960s and 70s, it was only meant to be stage one. There were plans to build more dams and canals in the 80s and 90s, but for various reasons, those projects were put on hold. It mainly came down to economics. California was struggling with rising debts, but there were other issues too, like environmental concerns. By disrupting the natural flow of rivers, these water facilities made things difficult for a number of local species. Populations of salmon and steelhead trout, which swim upriver during breeding seasons, collapsed in the wake of the SWP. With all those dams and pumping stations getting in the way, these fish can no longer reach their breeding sites. Because of all this, California decided to put the next round of construction on hold and hope the first stage of projects could do the job on their own. In the first few years, the new facilities definitely made a difference. About two thirds of the water collected by the system was given to people in urban areas, while the rest was used to irrigate orchards and farms. The entire system was estimated to provide about $400 billion to the statewide economy every single year.
But in the last few years, the existing components of the state water project have started to struggle. When these components were first built, California's population was less than 20 million people. But in the last few decades, the number of people living in the state has doubled. So has the demand for water, and the dams and canals find it hard to keep up. That's part of the reason why the state has had so many recent issues with drought. In the words of Mike Wade, executive director at the California Farm Water Coalition, our water demands have increased far beyond what the system was designed to support. I look out here and I see a beautiful day by the lake. What do you see? Climate change isn't helping either. In the last century or so, the average temperature in California has risen by almost 2 degrees centigrade, leading to severe, scorching heat waves. The droughts are getting worse, the population is getting bigger, and the water management system is in desperate need of an upgrade. That's why the state has decided to build the Sites Reservoir. A few kilometers north of Sacramento is a narrow valley with cliffs and hills along both sides. The terrain is dry and scrubby, with open plains of yellowish grass and clumps of bushes and trees. There are buildings too, but not many. Just a couple of clusters here and there, with a handful of local residents. The settlement is marked on the map as sites, but it isn't an official town. Now, the state wants to flood the valley and turn it into a lake. On the project website, the team describes it as an environmentally beneficial off-river reservoir that will capture excess water from major storms and save it for drier periods. This idea has been floating around since the 1950s. It was almost included in stage one of California's water management project. But the SWP eventually decided that the plans were too ambitious, especially considering the eye-watering cost of $4 billion. That's why they decided to focus their attention on other projects, like the Colossal Oroville Dam, but in the last few years they've had a change of heart. This project is worth the cost. If they can pull it off, the site's reservoir wouldn't solve California's droughts completely, but it would certainly help. The lake could store more than two cubic kilometers of water, enough to provide a year's supply of drinking water to hundreds of thousands of California homes. So, how will it be built? Workers will start with a number of dams, which will be used to plug any gaps between the hills at the edge of the valley. The two main dams will be the Sites Dam and the Golden Gate Dam, both on the eastern side of the valley, while the rest will be up in the north. Together, these dams will turn the valley into a giant waterproof tub. Next, they'll need to fill it. Usually, that's done by damming a river and letting it flood the valley. That's what happened with the Oroville Dam. The builders blocked the Feather River, then waited for the currents to fill the valley behind it. During periods of heavy rainfall, the river continues to fill the valley, keeping the reservoir topped up for future use. But the Sites Valley doesn't have any major rivers, just a couple of shallow creeks. Because of this, the new reservoir will need to be filled using a slightly different method. About 25 kilometers to the east of the valley runs the Sacramento River, the biggest river in California. During rainy months, the state is planning to suck water from the river, pipe it through fields and hills and towns, and pour it into the Sites Valley. It's like a giant water tap filling a giant bucket. During dry seasons, the water can be let out again, providing relief to nearby areas. Pumping water from the river to the valley will require a huge amount of energy, but the SWP think it's worth it, especially because they'll be making some of it back again. Whenever water is released from the reservoir, it will flow through a set of hydroelectric generators and provide approximately 80% of the power used to pump it there in the first place. Construction is currently on course to start in 2024, or at worst 2025. It will be finished six years later, in 2030 or 2031, and some people are already bemoaning the fact that it won't be ready sooner. When California was hit by those floods at the beginning of 2023, a huge volume of rainwater rushed down the Sacramento. If the site's reservoir had been up and running, it could have collected this flood water for future use, enough to supply more than 200,000 Californian households for the rest of the year. Jerry Brown, executive director of the Sites Project Authority, said this is exactly the type of scenario that Sites is being built for, short windows of extremely high flows. Without the Sites Reservoir in place, it was a missed opportunity, and people don't want to lose out again. But are there any drawbacks? Some people think so. To pay for the project, the SWP will probably raise the price of water, with some people fearing an increase of 300%. 
It's unclear whether this would actually happen, but it's a source of major concern. What's the point in supplying extra water if no one can afford to buy it? Environmental groups have also questioned whether the water pumped from the Sacramento River will affect the fish that migrate along the river. When a dam is used to block a whole river, like the one in Oroville, environmental disruption is inevitable. Fish can no longer swim up river because a wall of concrete is sitting in the way. But as an off-screen reservoir, the site project won't actually block the Sacramento River. The only disruption will be the high-power pumps, but those will be installed with state-of-the-art fish screens to stop animals from getting sucked inside. The SWP has also promised to use some of the water collected in the site's reservoir to support local species. Many fish species breed in deep, cold pools, and during dry seasons, these pools become warm and shallow. The site's reservoir would be used to feed these pools and keep water at the proper depth and temperature for breeding. It's an important part of the project as a whole. Supporting humans is the main priority, but helping other species is a target too. There's still a chance this project won't ever be built. They haven't quite raised enough funding. But as things stand, it looks as though the reservoir will be up and running by 2030. Do you think it's a good addition to California? Let us know in the comments below. And if you want to hear about the State Water Project, you should check out our video about the Oroville Dam. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you in the next video. Breaking scientific research shows that there's an everyday